So yes, my name is Jorge Moradera. Um, I'm principal research scientist at Recall Innovations, and today we'll talk about data analytics. Since you all have come from a long day of work, I'm actually not going to start with the heavy math. I'm going to start by playing a game. To motivate my game, I'm going to wage 80 actual dollars. And by the way, if you object to actual games which involve actual money, you don't have to play. Because in this game, there is actually money involved. <laughs> so these are $80, and they are not part of the game, meaning these are real dollars, and not, these are not fake dollars. And I'm going to play a following game with one of you. One of you, your choice, you come here, and I have a tag, actually, let me go to the next slide. Yeah, so I have a tag inside this ball. It looks exciting. It's, it's, it's this tag. It's not, it doesn't look like this. It's this tag. And I'm going to toss it. Well, actually, Lindsay, who is an innocent hand, is going to toss it. And one of you will come up, and I'll ask you to guess if you think the, the, the before, before she tosses it, whether it came up up or down. And if you guess right, I'll give you $80. It's not thinking. The, so, who would like to play this game? What if you're wrong? What's the catch, yeah. No, 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 it's no catch. This is the game. But I'm only going to play with one person, so I need to calibrate whether there is any interest in playing this game. Okay, so there is, I'm only going to play with one person. So, to choose this person, you're going to make an offer. You're going to bid for to play this game. And you don't have to play. So the way this is going to work is, if you want to play this game, you're going to write your name on this um, post-it note that is next to the piece of paper. And you're going to write the number of how many dollars you're willing to bid for the opportunity privilege of coming on a stage, being recorded on camera, <laughs> and guessing whether the camera is up or down. <laughs> the way this will work is the person who bids the most will come, will hand in their money. If you don't have exact change, I brought my checkbook so I can write the change back. I'll collect your money. Lindsay will toss the tag. If you win, you will work out with $80. If not, you will work out with nothing. This is the patient game, and this is a decision analysis game. So yes, it's a game, and this is also part of the lecture. So um, are there any questions on how the game works? Do you understand? Again, you don't have to play. So if you somehow are objecting to, oh, I think playing with money is bad, is evil, I don't. Just throw on the ground. Okay, that's a valid question. So the tag is inside this bowl. It's an ice cream plastic cup. I wanted to bring a glass one, but I was flying and I didn't bring a glass one. So anyway, Lindsay is going to toss this tag. The tag like this is going to put it flat on the table. Not this table. When she tosses it, she's going to unscrew the cup with making sure the tag didn't change. In this case, it came up. And she will say, up! Oh. And she will show it around. So she will only do it once, she'll shake it somewhere, put it maybe, she will put it on this table here, maybe. When I agreed because I didn't know there were $80 on the line, just saying. Right? <laughs> so, okay, so I'm put this here. You guys, it came, anyway. So this is it, and it's not too tight. Yeah. So you can, also, you can practice. So if you want to play, write it down now. I will be going back to front, collecting post-its. Right, so we'll collect the post-its, we'll pick the maximum, you'll we'll come here, um, I may ask you once you come here and you're the winner, I'll ask you to uh, give us a 10 second explanation of how you chose the number you chose. It doesn't have to be long, although if you want to come up with any longer explanation, I'll be willing to hear, but. So, so we'll do this. So think about how much this is worth to you, the opportunity to toss for the stack. This is our own mini mega million. <laughs> yeah, well, 80 bag, 80 bag million, so. And they are here, and actually I will do, yes, uh, waiting for you. Okay, so I, when you think you're ready, just to think we'll collect them. And then I have my By the way, you may want to write a weird, weird number, so if you want it to be like, say, $125, your reasonable amount, you, you write 125.97 or 95 or some weird decimal point so that I don't have to deal with a tie. If there is a tie, I will, I will pay the game twice for another $80 for the checkbook. But, um, but I don't have actual cash on the deck. There is a time to leave. Anyway, let's avoid the time by writing the same. Well, okay, this is, a, this is a lecture on how you handle the case where you don't have a lot of data. So that is a relevant question. <laughs> Yeah, name and money. Oh, right. no. And by the way, this is for real. So you're actually yeah. meaning to play this game because it's not a winner and we want you to come here with that amount of cash. 
And I would take PayPal if you happen not to have cash. I didn't advertise that you need to bring cash to play the game. And you don't need to play this, so if somehow my instructions are confusing, yeah. you don't know what I'm talking about, you feel like somehow, oh my god, these guys have to scam me. You don't have to, you don't have to play this. Like, oh come on, this is supposed to be the Asian expert, how can I possibly win at this? I did not invent this game, by the way. I, I want to have uh, credit to uh, Professor Howard. He was an instructor of mine 25 years ago when I was a PhD student at Stanford. And he played this game. I feel like he was richer than I was because 25 years ago he was being a hundred dollars. And I said, ah, this is great. <laughs> he lost his hundred dollars. So, okay, well, hey, maybe you can help me tell you that we have the right number. So I'll keep the maximum so far. Really? I'm not sure that that one works. I am happy to take it, but I don't know if that person is going to be happy. No. OK, well, <laughs> OK. So Ellie is our winner, and she's going to show up with $200. Yeah, she is. She's going to show up here with $200. She's not going to show up anywhere if she's going to show up. <laughs> oh, sorry, he. Hello, boss. So you are Ellie? Yes. And you, want, and you want to go me to $200? I'll take it out from my request. I bet I still have to pay for my request. Or no, like, talk to Lindy for the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, so. I vote, I vote, yes. Yes. Okay, well, then, then, then that's it. You come up and you have to come up with $200 and that's the end of the story. Okay, this is, an, this, is, this is a learning experience. This is a learning experience. I'm learning that. Okay, so I would like you to spend, you, you get in exchange for your $200, you get an. You get the $200, now $31. No, no, no. You understand what you committed to. Yes. <laughs> and you actually mean to, you are going to, you, you have to have a dollar with you right now. Uh, you have Venmo? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay, I'll take it. Okay. Download it. Venmo? Okay. <laughs> okay, what do you want? Uh, thumb up or thumb down? You need a table to do this flat and for sure. I'm good at the beach baby without crossing. This is good. <laughs> I didn't say I'm going to make money today. <laughs> Up or down? Down. It is up. Oh, 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 as much time as you want to explain it to us, why did you give $200 for this? <laughs> uh, Kareem uh, here, a friend uh, from undergrad that I should have trusted, looked at, he's an ear mechanical engineer by yeah. trade, correct? Mm -hmm. So he looked at this physically and he told me the odds of up coming like this are low, but it seems like the odds of the pin coming down are lower than up Kareem. Lower, so. that could still be 49, 51%. I just thought they'd be lower. Oh. But, but, but there's no scientific basis for okay, that. Okay, but, 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 but I am confused because let's say that he had come up up. Yeah. I will give you $80. Yeah. But you still will give me 200 Hey, you know, we did not agree to this. Okay, so there was some. Oh, so, you pay, so you pay $200 for the, for the right to play the game. So, I mean, I, I cannot understand. I'm French educated, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'm, no, no. I will tell you, okay. Th yeah, thank you, thank you. I'll tell you an explanation. <laughs> when this one is. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mike. You do, yeah. I'll talk later for the money. <laughs> <laughs> when I first did this 25 years ago, I actually won this. And the deal was 100, I did 100. And I was asked the same question. And I said, I have this study, the company on Bayesian analysis. And I wanted the opportunity to speak to a room full of people because we are actually hiring right now. So I stood up in that class to advertise that I had a position. And then I expensed my $120 to my boss at my company and said, hey, I just delivered a pitch for our company at the Stanford and it cost me $100, which I think is a great deal. <laughs> so I want to be reimbursed. So I was hoping that you know, I would come up with some story like this. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so thank you, thank you. Well, okay, now, now we are we're done with this. this is,
Now it's been bad because I'm expecting to actually have a warrior on this. Okay, never mind. We are moving on. So, so today we're going to talk about patient analytics. And basically, it's what do you do when you don't have big data? Um, and basically, you just saw an example. How do you estimate the probability of attack? Nobody in this room has thought attack. Frankly, I'm about to play the game, and I didn't have time to, do, to find out the odds. I have not played with the tag to find out what the odds are. I do not know what the tag is. I played it four times. It came out both ways at some point, so I said, you know what, we really have. My point is simply that in the real world, you are faced with the challenge of making decisions on things that are uncertain and that you actually cannot gather data or that is, you could, but it's not worth it for some reason or another. So, so the, basically the idea here is in Bayesian analytics, what we're going to do is there is a methodology that allows you to deal with these kind of problems in a principled way. So how do you build a model when you don't have a lot of data? And in particular, one of the things we're going to learn is how do you add data that is not of your main data set, well, it's not in your main data set to your modeling purpose. So you, have some, you don't have any data, you don't know anything, you know what you're about. But typically you know something. In this case, you're thinking of this and you're thinking, how different is a tag from a coin? Okay, you know what? The, the center of mass of the tag is how far up the pan. And depending on where the center of the mass is, I know that in the long run, there is a lower energy position when the tag is thumbs up. There is really, I mean, my intuition is the same, that I feel like this, but in practice, so, well, but then I don't know how, what is the local minimum, how much, I mean, you will have to do some kind of simulation. Anything. The point being that you're doing all this reasoning without any data. And the reality is, no, there is data. It's just that it's not data that came from my data set of the time. It's data that came from my other experiences in life, my other data set. So what we are going to try to learn in, in today is a set of techniques that allow you to incorporate this kind of knowledge. Now, I'm being a little, I mean, this was an example, this was just a game. In the real world, what's going to happen is you have a main data set and then you have other forms of data that don't seem to mesh so well with your main data set that you feel are relevant to your problem, but you don't know how to put them together to make a coherent model. Those are some, some of the things that I want to talk about. So, um, the first thing I want to describe today, uh, okay, so this is our schedule for today. Um, I'm going to spend about 20 minutes describing why don't we have data and Probably all of you will have some reasons, and we'll see many. Then I'm going to spend about 40 minutes doing heavy math and definitions, and this, this is section number four, and it will be heavy. Um, we'll try to get it over with early, but it's the foundation for what follows, so without it, it's just hard. And then we're going to go through into the interesting mathematics, which is what I would call probabilistic model. Uh, we're going to talk in particular about Bayesian networks, which is perhaps the most practical framework for doing Bayesian analytics. Um, then we're going to take a break um, around here, and it will be around 7.45. We started a little late, so I don't know, depending on what time we get to this point, the break will be 15 to 30 minutes, depending on how we are feeling. Then, after that, we're going to have, do have some experiments. We're actually going to open a tool that I, it's an open source tool that one can play to do some patient analysis, so we can learn some of these things. Um, and then we'll basically cover a few other remaining topics that I haven't covered before that. And then I'll end up with two real use cases. Um, these are courtesy of a company called Decision Q. Decision Q is a company I founded. Uh, at the time, this is the company I was telling you about the, the story of the time, the company that I ended up paying my hundred twenty dollars. So it's a company that still is active. Yeah, I was a chief scientist of this company, and I designed some Bayesian analytics software that it, they use. I'm no longer involved in the day-to-day -day activities of the company, but I asked them to provide me with some actual recent examples of how the software was being used in what real kind of problems. So they gave me two presentations of recent projects that they work on, so I'll cover them. You have copies of them in the back. I probably want to spend a lot of time. I did not actually do the modeling process of this, so I'll just talk very high level. But the goal of that is to show that what we are talking has a practical application, because at the beginning, this is going to sound like, well, it's either pie in the sky or just math. So I want to end up with saying, and then there is the one. That, that would be at the end. So 
And by the way, feel free to interrupt me or come here or raise your hand or say something at any point. I don't, we can take questions at the end, but by the end, probably we'll go home. So whenever you have a question, I'm happy to, to take a break and we can take this in any direction. For those of you who took my Python class at Northwestern, we talk about some of these things before. I think you find the material mostly new, but hopefully you'll be able to follow along. I mean, you'll be able to put together what you heard at the time with the new things. So, questions so far? No. You know what? Well, I am feeling really bad. I'm going to assume that you don't have to pay me anything, but I'm just feeling bad. I'm not going to be able to lecture well, think, feeling the way I'm feeling right now. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, just, I, mean, sir, I would allow you to lose 30 bucks, but 200. I was going to do 200. Anyway, so we're done with this. Um, so why don't we have big data? Why don't we have big data? Well, if you work for a company that claims to have hundreds of millions of customers, or most customers are free, but uh, anyway, you work for a company that has a lot of data. So if you work for a company that basically has, it works in the electronic domain, you think that at least in theory data is easy to come by. But at some point the bits meet the atoms and there is the real world component of things. And when you start working in the physical world, data becomes limited because it's expensive or there are legal or regulatory reasons or nature does things that you can control frequently. Both. Let's see some examples of some of these things. And I mean, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but predicting and assessing the damage and being able to understand how to best deal with emergencies, natural made emergencies like volcanoes or floods or earthquakes or large storms or pandemics, both in humans and in crowds. By the way, how many people, um, how many people of you have heard of the 1918 flu pandemic? Okay, four of you. How many people, um, let, let's accept, maybe, maybe, maybe. Let me tell you that there was a, a pandemic in 1980. This is a picture of that pandemic. I want a show of hands. How many people think that more than 100 million people were infected in that pandemic? Three of you think that more than 100 people. How many of, how many of you think more than 400 million people were infected in that pandemic? What do you think that more than 100 million? 500 million people were infected in that pandemic. So how many people do you think that in the pandemic? How many, people, how many of you think that more than 25 million people died in that pandemic? Three of you. How many people, more of you think that more than 50 million people died in that pandemic? Yeah. Five of you. How many of people think more than 80 million died in that pandemic? 80 million? Yeah. 100 million people died in that pandemic. Thank you. So my point is, this is more people than died in World War II and World War I. So, so these things do happen, and there is, this, this happened at the time where the world was preoccupied with other things, but the point being that these things have already happened. So being able to anticipate this, so now you may think when the avian flu happens and people are starting to be scared because the people who work on this know that these things have happened and that even at the time where the world was a lot less dense, people, maybe 100 million people died. So how do you model these things? When you start hearing of an avian flu, are we heading into something like that? Or are we heading into something, how, what measures should we take? And frankly, these things don't happen that frequently, so what kind of data do I have to model this kind of event? So, and then, how do I predict the next time a gigantic asteroid will come and will have an extinction level effect? How do you, how do you model this? I mean, how do you now, when is it due? How much money should I spend preparing for this, looking into space for probes? So, so the point being that there are times where nature plays a role and you don't control it. And because you don't control it, you can run experiments. And because you can run experiments, you cannot gather new data. So how do you deal with this? Now those are the natural ones. Then we have man-made disasters. And frankly, I don't want to show a picture of this because this is just very bad. So, so you can read about them. I don't have pictures. I mean, you can imagine this thing. But this is the same thing. These are still very, very, I mean, severe events with lots of people have died. I mean, if you think about what is called the cradle of civilization, the Purple Crescent in the Middle East, I was talking to I can see now. Kalim from, from Lebanon. This, this thing is, the, I mean, this place was called the cradle of civilization, the Fertile Crescent. These things are a desert now. It's a man made desert. Like, we have already changed the pattern of salinization. The weather has gotten dry. The point being that all these countries, like Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, the old Persia, basically, 
it is has become very dry. So this the, the weather pattern change is something that's been happening for a long time. It's just, so anyway, how do we deal with this kind of thing? How do we gather data when they did a soil scratch? Now, other reasons, in addition to man disasters, whether natural man-made or natural man-made, is cost. There are things for you can you can gather data. If you want to know how how a plane will break, you get you build yourself twenty thousand planes, you find them, play them continuously for ten years, and you see how they fall down. <laughs> but that takes a long time, and it is expensive. And by the way, you're not these are fly planes that you see. When you expect to crash, you're actually not using them for anything. So this is just not practical. But the same thing for a satellite. How how will the satellite? What, what will happen to it when it's in orbit for twenty years? Let's launch it to Saturn. But why don't we launch twenty to Saturn to gather some data and then launch the real one, right? So so this is an interesting. But, but, but I'm showing these things because this is a real problem, right? We do launch these things. They cost a lot of money. And how do you know what is going to fail, right? When your car breaks down or something, and there are millions of cars we collect data, and if it fails, well, we call the mechanic. What happens when you've spent 20 years launching one of these programs and then it breaks? So, or how do you collect data for how a self-driving car will handle some weird emergency that has never happened? I don't know, like a basketball and a football simultaneously coming from both sides and two kids running. <laughs> weird situation, right? So the answer is, Basically, it is hard to come by with data in very real problems. Another reason you don't have data is ethical considerations. And actually, this is the domain where I mostly work in decision queue and where decision queue works, which is, so you're trying to predict the efficacy of a drug treatment. You're trying to give the patient the best treatment for the patient. Well, what is the best patient? Well, you know, well, let's try 20 different things. I have 20 patients. I don't think this one is going to work, but maybe we'll let's try 50 guys. So this is not acceptable, right? So the reality is that you give the patient the treatment that you think will help him best. You don't experiment with your patient. And that is unacceptable. At least today we don't experiment. There are some sad cases, both in Nazi Germany and during the Japanese occupation of China during World War II, where people did experiment with, with human beings to see how these things work and to collect some data. I mean, this is clearly unacceptable today. And anyway, I don't think there's any point in talking more about this. But but you could not purposely infect or injure patients or populations. But this is a challenge from a developing a test because you want to see if a new system that you have is going to predict the efficacy of a drug or a combination. But you cannot just run a clean test. You are giving him this drug today and then tomorrow you're giving him this other one because you think it will help him. And you cannot just continue the course of this one because you're giving him the one that will help him the most. So instead of, well, let's kind of just collect some clean form of data. So that's another reason. There is finally um, the issue that if you work for a company, the data may exist, they just don't want to give it to you. <laughs> and this actually is a common problem. Um, it can happen for regulatory and privacy considerations. Sometimes there is medical data. But well, you have to get patient consent and get it to IRBs and certain protocols in order for you to get access to this data. And this may or may not be made available to you. In some other industries, like the banking industry, there is data, and you're not allowed to use it, even though it is clearly predicted. It's not predicted because it's causal, and we'll talk about that later. But it is clearly correlated, and it will help you make better predictions. And yet, you're not allowed to use it. In some cases, even within your own company, they may not want to give you the data because it's in a different group, and they consider that to be a very crucial piece of their business, and it's just not something that we share with the data analysts. So there are all sorts of reasons. But the point being simply that there are no data. And by the way, sometimes you are asked to predict things that have never happened before. Like, you will hear all the time, well, how many planets have life in the galaxy? Well, how do I answer this question? Based on what? Do I just guess? Like, and the answer is, we will see that visual analysis gives you a method to actually answer this question in a way that doesn't look like you're just pulling it out of your arm. Um, so, so how do you model phenomena you've never seen? How can it, I mean, how can even you come up with a method that even Seems reasonable, right? So, well, I've never seen this. I'm not saying it's impossible, but how would I base a probability? I mean, how would I ascribe a probability to an event I've never seen? So, we will see techniques to handle this kind of thing. So, the point being simply that machine learning, deep learning, well, machine learning, this is machine learning too, but um, deep learning, big data learning are useful when you have big data. And I think if you have big data, you are in a good situation. It's a helpful thing. But there are plenty, I mean, my goal on this 10, 13 minutes was to show you that there are plenty of real world cases where you don't have big data. 
and you still don't have to a job to do. You have to make a prediction, and there are costs associated with your prediction. If you're an insurance company, predicting when an earthquake will happen, how much damage it will cost, is valuable because it will drive the, the cost of the premium, and the cost of the premium will drive your business. And if you can realistically come up with this, and by the way, if you make mistakes, you go bankrupt, and this happens also in the financial crisis where people try to predict. I mean, all of these vision techniques are used a lot in the stock market because you're trying to predict the future and you don't have much data. And, but we all know about the financial market. I'm not going to talk about that. So, <laughs> all right, so that was my introduction. Are there any questions on the introduction? That was pretty discreet. I mean, it was very colorful. So now we're going to go into the heavy math now. So, so Bayesian statistics. So, what is the word Bayesian? What does what, what, what is the word? So it comes from Thomas Bayes. Uh, he was an 18th century. He was actually a minister. He had a um, I forget what they call it, party or something like that in in the UK. But one of his hobbies was doing mathematics and statistics in particular, and uh, and he wrote down a formula which is now has his name. He wrote it down in a very narrow context. Now it's a very broad thing. It's called Bayes' theorem, which we're going to see in the next slide. So anyway, that's the word Bayes, where the winner Bayesian comes from. So he had a thing was working in the statistics and probability. So, so this is Bayes' theorem. Um, and one of the key concepts, there's going to be a lot of keywords that I want to define at least once in the slides, because later I'm going to just start using them a lot. I'm going to start slowly and then I'm going to throw a lot of them. So, I'm going to be talking about events. So what's an event? Later I want to make this very precise, but for now let's just say an event is something that, can, that, ha that has happened or can happen or could happen. And it's a concrete thing. Um, and I'm using this notation. So P of B is the probability. At this point I'm talking about probabilities as if you know, I'm defining. I can later define what the probability means and all that. But basically P of B is the probability that this event happened. And it's called the marginal probability means if I knew nothing else about the world, what's the likelihood that this will happen in the future? Or it has happened in the past that I don't know about. Now notice that this is coming from a, f and there is an underlying assumption here in which we are modeling the world in this probabilistic fashion, which means in traditional logic, logic you will apply syllogism like say, well, if this is true, then that is true. In a probabilistic model, you say, well, if this is true, then that is true with some probability. And that is called conditional probability. This is what this meaning, what this formula means is if this is true, either because I know it or because let's assume that it is, then what is the probability that this, uh, that this other thing is true? And this is how I, this formula and this expression basically means the probability of B given A. Assuming that A is true either because it really is or because for my modeling assumptions I'm going to assume that it is, what is the probability of B? So within the subset of events where A has happened, which fraction of them has to have B also happened. So a Bayes theorem basically says that the probability of event A happening, given that event B happened, is basically this problem. We are going to, in a second, prove that this is true, actually prove, I and mean, it would be a picture, but it would be a real proof. Um, but this is Bayes theorem. This, is, this black line is just an artifact of this thing. So, the marginal probability of an event basically is the probability of this event happen given no additional information or more precisely given some background information that is constant for the whole universe and we'll talk about this later. And this dash basically means a conditional probability. If, assuming within the set of spaces where this is true, how likely this is true. So, a good way to visualize things, and I, this is a picture from Wikipedia. Um, and I'm going to spend a few minutes, let me see how it looks with, because there are more lines. In addition to my lines, there's new lines here. <laughs> okay, not too bad. So, I'm going to spend, this is a very simple picture once you get it. So for those of you who have seen this picture before, this, this is trivial, but I want to spend a couple of minutes on it. Because this is a picture when we go to real world problems. If you can keep this picture in mind, many things start making sense. So in a very simple world where there are only four, in a very simple world where basically something called A can either happen or not happen, something called B can either happen or not happen, there are only four possible joint scenarios, which is 
both of them happen, neither of them happen, A happened and B didn't happen, uh, B happened and A didn't happen. If I had some data, this, were, this, this A and B were some variables of some data set that I had, I could just count in my historical data and I could fill in four numbers for these four boxes. And this would be that thing. Um, again, this is a very simple exercise, but if we understand this picture, it will be clear. From this picture, we can define intuitively, not formally yet, intuitively probability as the ratios of some things happening over things. So for example, what is the marginal, okay, what is the marginal probability of A? I, what, what is it? What's the expression? What is the number? Marginal probability of A. Okay, so B of A equal? So W plus X divided by everything. Yes, that's correct. So basically P of A is in the whole world, which fraction of the time does A happen? Well, A happens here and here. The whole world is this whole thing. So W plus X divided by the whole thing is P of A. And I don't know if I have that. Yes, okay, so we have P of A here. So that won't be this good expression. Um, what is P of, say, not B given A? That one is not written, that's why I'm asking that one. X over? P of not B over A. Given A, P of not B given A. X over W plus X, that's right. So what does it mean, P of not B given A? It means in the subcase, uh, of a scenario where A has happened, which fraction B hasn't happened? Okay, well, the subcase of cases where A has happened is this piece of the world. So it's W plus X. Of which, in, the, in this one, uh, sorry, this one, B didn't happen. So the fraction of cases where B didn't happen, among those cases where A happened is X divided by W plus X. Again, this is a very simple picture, but I'm going to throw 20 variables later and I'm going to do this at the same speed. So we know, and there will, will be no pictures. So if hopefully at this point you feel like you could compute any of these P of A given B, P of not A given B, P of B given not A, etc., etc., etc. And from this, you could prove that in this very little scenario, Bayes theorem is true. Um, Basically, P of A given B basically is the same times P of B is the same thing as P of B given A that is given P of A. And if you look at P of uh, Bayes theorem, in Bayes theorem, one of these things basically goes divided the other side and that's Bayes theorem. So in this very small scenario, this is true. We will see this later in the marginal case. Are there any questions about this slide? Okay, by now you're telling me that any of you, if I ask one of these questions, you will not have one of it. Is that correct? I may pick one of you right now at random, so if this is not correct, this is the time to basically say, can you say one more time? Okay, please. Great. So, so um, in the formulas until now, we've been talking about events. Um, and I've been using a letter for an event, so I just say, well, this just means something happened. Uh, and well, we've been using some examples of, of using letters for events. Um, one way of creating more complicated events is by listing them together. So for example, sorry, that's not what I'm seeing in my slide. Okay. So I, I, I guess I'll go first to this. Well, this one we already saw. Basically, when there is two events and in the world either one happens or the other happens, so basically when the events are uh, Mutually exclusive meaning they cannot both happen at the same time. And collectively exhaustive means one of the set for sure has happened. You can use this notation. So this notation, x and not x, is very convenient. They say, okay, either this happened or it didn't happen. And there is no other option. Um, sometimes events get more complicated. It's not like, well, this could happen, but then this could happen or not, or they could both happen. Things could. Anyway, another way of making events more complicated is this other notation. So for example, by A, not be with or without a comma in between, I'm referring to the event, single event where this happened and this didn't happen. 
And then I can construct very complicated events. I could have the event where I flew to San Francisco, but my plane was late, but I didn't eat lunch at time, but I, the car rental was on time. And that could be a very complicated event, and that would be one event, and it would have some probability. And it would be constructed, I mean, I could write it in some, in some notation using this, this. A more common way in data analytics to refer to events is typically I am modeling some data, my data has some variable, uh, an event is a variable takes this value. So, well, I don't know, the gender could be, keep, let's keep it simple, things are more complicated. Well, a gender could be male or female. So, my variable is gender, I can take two values of them, male and female. Um, and then I hope this could be my variable gender, and this could be a set of variables. And then I would write the event as C equals D, gender equals male. Um, and it's a type of event, and I can write this thing. Um, if in these cases, by the way, my variables can start having longer letters. I could actually write not just the letter G, but the whole word gender. And things come in my expression. Um, when I have variables and values, typically I use capital letters for the values and lowercase for the values. That's when, when in the same formula I have variables and values. Um, and finally, if the variable is obvious, I may not write the variable. So instead of saying gender equals male, I say probability of male. When I say probability of male, what I am trying to say is probability gender equals male. And I will only say probability of male when it's clear which variable I'm talking about. You have to remember that you have a data set and I'm talking about a particular variable in my data set. So if the variable I'm talking then, I can refer to the event variable takes this value by just probability of value. And what I'm trying to say is variable takes this value. So it's just, this is a matter of notation, but when we go into more complicated things, it's helpful that all of this is understood. So when we have formulas, we understand what the formula means. Um, it is convenient to sometimes, in the abstract sense, in some abstract formulas, to use values that tell me what variable I'm referring to. Like, for example, if my variable is g, then I can use the letters g1, g2, g3 as the values. And then instead of having to say J, capital G equals lowercase G1, I can just say event is G1. And that means variable capital J takes value G1. And again, my values could be something like it rained yesterday. So, or amount of G could be amount of rain yesterday, and G1 could be some range of millimeters per square meter or something, and G2 could be a different range of yesterday. And in this case, basically, again, if the variable is understood, I can just refer to it as k as the event, and just, I just need this variable takes this value. So this is just notation. It's not complicated. Um, so the, the purpose of this note is um, now I feel it's less important at the time I wrote it, but the goal here was that these variables, I'm, I'm using the word variable, I'm, I'm using all these words, which I'm defining some of them and, and not using some of them. In this case, I'm basically using this idea of discrete probabilistic variable. Basically, this is a variable that refers to a bet that could happen in the future and it takes some discrete set of possibilities, right? So typically, the values of, oh, when I list all the possible values that G can take, they form a basically mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive set, meaning at the end of the day, in the world, this variable will take exactly one of these and no more values. Uh, this is all very formal. It will make more sense later of why we care about these things. So to make this concrete, um, in the second half of this heavy theory section, um, and I'm, let's say foundational theory, the heavy theory to come. Um, I want to basically use Bayes' theorem for classification. I'm classifying two, two variables. It's something that probably you learned in high school, depending on what you went to high school. Um, so basically, this is very simple. Um, you have a certain value variable that you can observe. It's a probabilistic variable. Um, I don't have a concrete example in mind right now. It could be whether it rained in the highway, whether the highway is wet, or how high, or how wet the highway is. And then you're trying to predict whether it rained this morning or not, based on whether, how wet the highway is. 
So basically, by classification, what we mean is we want to predict the value of a probabilistic value, uh, variable, which, we, which, which you don't know. And that variable takes a finite number of possible classes. It belongs to a finite number of possible classes. It could be either a drain or a dividend, or it could be something like uh, the score between, what, between 0 and 10, between 10 and 50, between 50 and 100, or more than 100. So we take one of those four possible values. And basically, by classification, we mean predicting the value of categorical variables. Variables that take a discrete number of values. Um, by regression, by the way, we mean uh, the problem of finding out the value. So if you, I mean, if you've done regression analysis, you've done problem classification, and you say, well, what is the difference? What is the difference? You're, still, you're basically trying to make a prediction, and you're making your prediction either on a discrete variable, and then you call it the problem of classification, or on a continuous variable, and you take it the problem of regression. So, um, so you're trying to make this, and basically, how do we? The goal here is to use Bayes' theorem to make a prediction on the class C. Typically, you might now add the distribution of C. Um, and what do I mean by the distribution of C? So now, it's important that we remember what we saw before, because now, C here is not an event; it's a variable. So what does this expression mean? Right? Well, if this was an event, if I wrote probability that the variable C takes the value C once, I well, this is the probability that this event will happen. So what do I mean when I say probability of a variable? So when I say probability, say that, that going back to the simple basic example, like the probability of gender. What is probability of gender? What, what I'm trying to say here, what I'm trying to, to show by that is this is a, is a, is a function. Basically, it's a function that says, OK, you give me a gender, I'll give you a value. Female, 0.7. Male, 0.3. So the idea is basically a formula which has probabilistic variable should be interpreted as a function where when you assign a value to each of the variables, it gives you a number. So this is pretty, again, this is pretty heavy. Bear with me. We will be over the hurdle in 20 minutes. Um, so basically, probabilistic expressions that contain variables are called potentials. Um, and again, they are functions that map for each variable you assign. You, you basically, the idea is if you give me a value, the formula will give you a value. So in this particular expression, what this is saying is if you give me a value for this variable, I'll give you a, a, a value. So, so basically, in, that, in particular, it means I know the probability of each of the events of the variable taking that value. So. Enough, this is a lot of work. <laughs> so, basically, what uh, I'm not even going to talk about this. I just look at your eyes glaze and I think, okay, okay, too late for this. So, basically, the point being that base theory tells me that the probability. So I'm trying to guess what is the class of, uh, of the variable C, given that I have observed that the variable A takes the variable alpha. Well, basically, what I'm interested in is, OK, let's pick the C sub i, basically the value of the variable C, that makes this expression the largest. That's called the R max. So basically, I'm going to take the value of, of C sub i. I'm going to compute this expression for every possible value of C sub i. I'm going to take the maximum. And that, basically, will be the i that we pick. That's, that's the prediction I will make. And basically, I will compute that by making this product, which we saw before in base theory. Um, there is a lot of details here. And for those of you who have seen this before, this is trivial. For those of you who haven't seen it, you probably think you understand it. And by the end of the lecture, hopefully you will. So are there any questions so far on any of this? And I'm concerned if there are any. Let me just your thought of this. Oh, maybe. OK. <laughs> I'm not sure what it means. So. No question. So terms that I mean this is just math. So these are names that appear all the time in the literature. You hear about them, you hear about priors, you hear about posteriors, you hear about likelihoods and all of these patient analytics. What does it mean? Um, so this is the same expression of base here, and this is the one I just had before. And this is just to keep it very simple. So each of these terms has a name. So E is the variable, is the thing that 
just happened that I have observed and that I'm using to try to say, hey, given that I observed that this just happened, what is the class of the variable that I'm trying to believe that I didn't observe? Okay, this is my problem. Well, the thing that it just happened is called evidence. This is what you've seen. This is the, this is the data that you have to be able to make prediction. Whether what happened was likely or unlikely depends on the probability of the evidence. So this term is called the P of E, called probability of the evidence. And frankly, it has some values which are advanced which I won't cover today. But it really you don't care because this thing just happened. Whether, oh my god, this was so unlikely that the tax fell this way and at the same time I trip over my thing and I embarrassed. Well, it just happens. So whether it's a likely or unlikely event, it typically bears little importance to your prediction. But it has some. Then the prior probability of each class is some things are rare. So this goes back into the famous claim that says extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. If I were to tell you this looks like a marker, but it is not. This is an alien spaceship that landed in my backyard yesterday and came from Alpha Centauri, and it has microscopic aliens living on it. You say, okay, I don't have a lot of data on this particular problem, but that just seems really unlikely. So, basically, the probabilities of classes, class, this, this is a variable, and it has two possible values. One, this is a red marker, that is a dry eraser. It might be the same one I used there, but it isn't because the one I used before it was this one. This is a marker, this is a fish. So, the point being that if I'm going to make the prediction that this is a spaceship, I'm going to have to have a lot of evidence to support that. Because my a priori probability, and that's called prior, my prior probability for this class taking the value a spaceship is very low. So I need to have a lot of supporting evidence given a spaceship. I need to see the aliens coming out of the thing right now. Otherwise, it's a marker. <laughs> So the point is, when you understand this, this is what it means. So likelihood is the probability of the evidence given a class. If you saw aliens coming out of here right now, you have to believe, but God, this is really a weird market. It's, it's, maybe it's not the right, right? So the probability of, and this one is a number we can ascribe. I've never seen, I mean, you probably have seen the marker case before, but you probably haven't seen the spaceship, because I believe I'm the first one who's, who has had a spaceship, and this is what they call me anyway. So, and I should treat their spaceship more nicely before I correct it. Anyway, so the point being that it is important to understand uh, this is where these names come from, right? So some classes have, a, and invasion analysis this is important because it means that even though you have some evidence for this being a spaceship, you still are not, so okay, I have seen some evidence, Jorge has claimed that he's a trustworthy instructor, he's a Northwestern instructor, he wouldn't like me in class, he's being recorded, he's going to be published, he's saying this is a spaceship. Okay, I'll ascribe some value to that. Well, frankly, that's not enough. <laughs> and the point being that basically the likelihood, you, you can see basically you can see how these terms play around, right? So at the end of the day, the probability of the class is so low that unless you have overwhelming evidence to go for that class, even if the evidence points to the class, and say, well, the evidence points to the class, but the class is so rare. So now you can see how the two terms play out each other, right? And this is why something that makes Bayesian analysis different from other forms of analysis is this idea of using priors. And we'll see this later. So the problem is, even before I look at the data set, some things are just very rare, and as such, the amount of evidence that I will need to go before I choose to go in that direction of prediction has to be high. Now, I'm being a little, before I had very heavy math, and maybe it wasn't clear, I was saying the same thing I'm saying now. This is just another way of saying it, which is more memorable. So, by the way, this is where the names come from. So, probability of the evidence, the prior probability of my of my prediction, the posterior probability. After I weighed in the evidence, what is the probability of the class? Given the evidence, what is the probability of the class? This was the marginal probability. I mean, this is before. Anyway, this is something that I could, this is something that I would have gotten from my data set, my modeling. Okay, this has to be a spaceship. What would be the likelihood of certain things? That's where the likelihood would come. What would be the likelihood that I observe this thing if this happened to be the, the, the a spaceship? What would be the likelihood of this other thing is this, like the fact that you saw me put this thing there and have it, anyway, moving on, no more need of the space. They so you put this the alpha centauri. So, um, what I just said basically is traditionally talk about maximum likelihood predictions versus maximum a posteriori predictions. And if you've done classification in your work or in your coursework, um, you probably have heard these terms, and by now it should be clear what it means. Um, 
the maximum a posteriori estimate is what the theorem allows us to do with, in the case of two variables, is basically you pick the class for which the product of these two is the largest. In a maximum uh, likelihood estimate, you just take the likelihood and you take the class that has the maximum likelihood. And you don't consider that some classes are less likely than others a priori, even before looking at the data. This is something that you get from your data. This is something that basically a priori, I mean, you also get from some other data. But where did you get the likelihood that this was not a spaceship? Like where did, which data did that come from? So anyway, that's where the prior priority comes from. So this is the difference between a maximum like we could estimate a maximum a posterior estimate that you probably have heard. These are called, sometimes you will see this abbreviated as MAP. No? So, any questions on this? Okay, good, 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 good. So, okay, so that was the heavy introduction to, to the theory. Now we're going to move Still on theory, but we're going to start making this sound more realistic, like less abstract. We're going to give names to our variables and do more interesting stuff. Um, so basically, I want to basically transition between what is Bayesian analysis, analysis and probabilistic analysis to say that basically the two features that characterize Bayesian analysis, what you can say, what is Bayesian analysis? What is this Bayesian analysis? The idea is you build models in order to make predictions for something. Later we'll see that you make predictions in order to make decisions, or you make decisions in order to maximize something, which in the naive case might be profit, in the real world is a lot something more complicated. But the idea is basically, so in Bayesian analysis you build models, and those models are probabilistic. You use probabilistic variables in your model, and we've been getting a flavor of how these things look. And the models incorporate prior knowledge, and this is a crucial aspect of Bayesian analytics, and what prior knowledge basically means, not necessarily means you guess things. It means you incorporate data sets that are heterogeneous and that are not typically easy to mix. And we've been I'm giving you this example. This is like the spaceship, but like, how did I guess? If I was a five year old, maybe I would have believed more readily than you guys that this was a spaceship. So the idea is you are using some prior knowledge that you have gathered from some real, real world data. It's just that it's not the same data set that you have used in other things. So the idea is how do we incorporate all of this knowledge that is real, meaning it's not a guess. And this is important, right? Because yes, you can guess things in patient analysis and people do that. That's not the point and that's a bad idea. Anyway, so um, you have prior knowledge. And we will see in a minute that the most common form of prior knowledge in practice is something called conditional independence. And we will see what that looks like. And of course, the reason in Bayesian analysis we do these two things is not a coincidence. The reality is these two ideas make sense separately. Like the world, when we say the world, the world is probabilistic, I'm not trying to make an epistemological statement about the nature of the universe. What I'm trying to most is a practical statement about my understanding and my level of knowledge. And the answer is well, because I don't know everything, and I don't mean everything early. I don't mean I don't know everything that's relevant to my prediction problem. I cannot make a, an exact prediction because there are just things that are relevant that I don't know. So because of this, I use probability. And the nice thing about uh, basic division analysis is that in probabilistic models, that it is easy in probabilistic models to incorporate prior knowledge. And that's what we're going to see in the next section of how these two things work nicely together. So questions? No? OK. God, you are all guys to say that I think it's because I'm missing a slice instead of writing on the board. So, so, yeah, so we're moving on to probabilistic models. So, basically, you have a domain, it may be your users and how much they purchase and how frequently they click and which websites they visited and whether their eyes are itchy or not. And whether they buy something or not, and whether they have a, they like drinking or not drinking, and whether they drink while browsing or they don't drink while browsing, and whether you should drink while browsing or not, and that will make your browsing less safe. I mean, it's, anyway, the point is you have variables, and you are intended to predict, given something that you know, either because you know something about the user, you know something about the world, what other, basically you know the value of some variables, and you're trying to predict the value of some other variables. One interesting thing about Bayesian analytics is 
There is no independent and dependent variables like in traditional analysis. There are no, well, these are my variables. All the variables are symmetric. You can decide that you know whichever ones and that basically you predict the other ones. And this allows you to do some very interesting scenarios because it, for example, allows you to start assessing how much is it worth to me to get these variables. Yes, I can do it. And this is the cost. If I were to get this variable, how much money would I expect to make in based on the fact that I will have more data to make, in theory, a better decision. So these basically probabilistic models are very well suited to doing this kind of analysis, where you can start deciding whether acquiring more data is worth, or more precisely, how much you see, how much information you expect to get, and we will see more of this. So, so okay, so this is the formal definition um, of probability spaces. We've been talking about this informally before. You may have seen this in some of your math classes earlier. Um, basically, a probability space represents our uncertainty regarding an experiment. And it has two parts, uh, omega, which is a probability space, which is basically a sample space which represents the, the possible things, the set of events that could actually happen. And then we have a probability measure, which is just a function that for every event, it tells you how likely it is that event to happen. It's just a real function on the subsets of omega. So for every set of events, how likely is that subset of events? Um, so a set of outcomes in uh, omega is called an event. P of A represents, wait, we already now, basically we already seen what this means. This is just a formal definition, so we have it. So, in, in typical data analysis, my events take the form of a variable takes a value. That's not always true, and if you were coming at this from a more theoretical, this is actually, you might think not, but this is a very practical introduction to probability. This is, the real probability is a lot more abstract and more different. So, anyway, so this is very practical. So, in a, in a practical scenario, pro events are variable takes value. Um, maybe the event is a combination of this variable takes value and this variable takes value and this variable takes value. When that is true, uh, then I can discuss this uh, talk about my probability measure as a joint probability distribution. Joint refers to all of my variables together, meaning not only I understand how likely is gender to be male and how likely it is for shoe to be black, but I also understand the relationship of these two things. I also understand how likely it is for the event, the gender to be male and the shoe to be black. So that's the meaning of the word joint in this scenario. So not only I understand my, my variables separately, but I understand them together. I understand how they relate to each other. Um, if this is a crucial statement, a crucial should have maybe been orange, and this is something that by now should be obvious, but basically if all my variables can take a finite set of values, then the joint probability distribution basically can be specified for every combination of values of my, basically I take every variable, I send it every possible value, I, I find the probability of that particular combination. At the end, all of these combinations are up to one, and that's everything there is to know about my world. If some of my variables are continuous, then they can take an infinite number of values, then a real number, then things are a little more complicated. But as we will see, actually, in Bayesian analysis, we typically use discrete variables, even when our real world problem is continuous, we'll see this more later. So actually, in theory, this is this simple. Bayesian analysis is this simple. We'll see why this and in a second, but um, I'm going back, this is the slide we've seen before, um, but by now it should be completely clear, this is exactly the joint probability distribution of two binary variables, A and B. So yes, if my world has two variables, A, which can be true or false, and B, which can be true or false, then my joint probability distribution is the four possible cases and every possible question I might have about my universe, any possible prediction, hey, if I now B, Say that I know B. Well, can I predict A? Well, sure. Probability of A given B. How much is probability of A given B? Say what? Right. So basically, the point is, so basically, you know, you can see how this would be data analytics. You have observed this about your user. This is what you're trying to predict. And you can see basically from this, you can make any prediction about the user. For some other user, you've observed something that you can make any prediction. So the point being that if you have the joint probability distribution, then you can compute all your 
modeling questions that you have. And later we'll see that you add basically some utility nodes and decision nodes, and you're in business. So, so let's, leave, let's, let's, let's see a concrete example. We saw an example with two variables, let's see a more interesting example. This is a classic example by Judea Pearl 25 years old now, but we will go through it because it's an interesting example and we're actually going to do this in a hands-on scenario, so it's worth going through the scenario. So this is still a very tiny problem, but bigger. So in this world, I have five variables. Um, the scenario is as follows. I am at work. I am a salesman. I am on the call, and I call to make an important deal that's going to make me some money if I close it. Um, so I kind of pick up my phone. But then my, my, my buddy, my neighbor, John, calls. So I cannot pick up. So I let it go to voice. My, my neighbor, Mary, calls. So I cannot go by phone. However, I have this arrangement with my neighbors where if they hear my burglar alarm ringing, they will call me. Now, of course, I don't know if they call me to tell me that the burglar alarm was ringing or they call me for some other reason. Now, if we go into the details, you will find that John will call me if he hears alarm. But sometimes he confuses the, the house for ringing, so he calls me for other reasons. He go, basically, he calls me for, for reasons which is not the one. Now, Mary, Mary um, doesn't call me, she doesn't mishear the alarm. The problem is she hears, she listens to music all the time. So she may not hear alarm even though it is ringing. Now, as a further problem, my alarm may trigger for reasons, even if I don't have a burglary, my alarm may trigger. In fact, if there is an earthquake, my alarm may trigger. Um, so basically, this is my alarm. Later, again, we're going to spend time, and later we'll, we'll build onto this. This is the basic stuff. So the question is, well, how do I start building this model? Okay, well, I'm going to build my joint probability distribution. So, Okay, so basically, um, for now, I need, I have, to, I, I basically, basically, for now, we're going to just model this problem. We're still not going to make the decision part, so we're just going to model the, the distribution. Um, so we're going to have a joint probability distribution over my five binary variables so that I can answer questions like this. If I have just missed a call from John, what's the probability that the burglar is happening in my house? Later we'll ask the question, what if I just miss a call from Mary? What if I miss a call from both of them? Which I would write like P of, basically, now this is not the expression, this is the, the math that before I skip, but now it's worth explaining. Basically, what am I saying by that? I says, I want to find the value of B that makes this expression maximum. The value I care about is not the probability that my house is being, um, basically, what I care about is not the probability, but what is most likely, that is that I'm being burglar or, or, right, or I'm not being burglarized. So by the maximum, I would mean what's the biggest of, okay, this is a set of numbers, what is the largest of these numbers. By the arc max, I mean what is the basic, basically the value that makes, that gives me the maximum. What's the value of B that gives me the maximum? Not what the maximum probability is, but what is the value of B that gives me the maximum? Okay. So this would be just one such question, like, as we have seen before, I could be answering any other question. What's the probability that I know my husband being, there's an earthquake because I hear it on the radio, which is not part of my model here. But I'm keeping my model super simple. In the real world, things get more complicated. But basically, I can answer any question. So, and, and again, so I basically model this. I'm going to just model it as binary variables. The reality is this is a more complicated world. This is, even for this particular data set, I would use more complicated things, right? Because there are other things that can trigger my alarm. There is what I can listen on the radio. There are many things I could do, but I'm going to just keep it simple. In the real world, we will have to do them, but here we go. Well, okay, so this is my joint probability distribution, right? What do I mean? What do I mean by this? Okay, who will read this to me in English? What does this mean? This is an, sorry, with the letter E, what is this? This is an event. Okay, so each of these are each of these are events. What is this event exactly? Something happened where at all John didn't Right, so basically there is an earthquake. I'm in Berlin. The alarm is ringing. John didn't give his call, but, uh, but Mary did. This is the case. I assign such a number. How many entries are in this list? Hmm? Okay, so there are 30, there are two to the five, right? Yes, 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 yes. No, we did this in class. 
a long time ago for those who took the class. Um, okay, so there are 32. How many independent ones are here? So how many independent numbers are here? How many numbers do I have to produce to give to produce the whole table? Do I need all 32 of them or can I leave with fewer? All 32. Well, actually, I only need 31 because they add up to one. So if you give me the first 31, the last one is okay, and whatever, if, if none of the other 31 cases is happening, then this one is happening. So I need 31 of them. Okay, well, what problems do you see? We were trying to build a business of, hey, you know what I build? I sell this alarm device. But not only that, it comes on top with a Bayesian model that not only tells you whether the alarm is ringing, but it tells you whether you should act on that. Right? We have all this thing, we have to perform that, and all that, we're really charging one. But we need to fill in these numbers. What problems do you see filling in these numbers? In this real, in this particular example, not in the general world, in this real world. Some of those have probably never happened. That's right. It's like, okay, well, we still have anybody using to fill in this number. When is the last time that an earthquake happened and a burglary was happening at the same time? Like, they just, I mean, this would be prohibitively special. In fact, this goes back to the satellite approach, right? Like, okay, well, how many other earthquakes have been solved before I fill in the table? And the answer is probably you'll never be able to fill in this table. So even in this tiny problem, we are saying, okay, how am I going to manage this thing? So this is a problem. Um, so uh, this is this is the map. I'm skipping it because I'm just going to the intuitive approach. This is I, actually I'm not going to skip. I'm going to go back to the previous slides. I'm going to do, I'm going, I'm going to cover this slide without formulas. I'm going to cover it from here. Is it clear that from this table I could complete the answer to any question? It's just no question. So at this point, silence is a bad answer. So before I ask questions, in silence was a reasonable answer. When I said, "Did you understand?" or "Is there any question?" In this case, it's a just no question. So it's either clear or not clear. Okay. Well, I'm going to take that as a no. So, okay. Say, let's compute an example. Say I want to know what is the probability that I am being burglarized, which is what I care about. At the end of the day, this is for now, given that both John and Mary call, right? Okay, what is this number? Well, what this number is, first of all, I'm going to divide, I'm going to add a bunch of things and divide it by another bunch of things. The things on the bottom are the things where John and Mary call. Where are the things that John and Mary call? Where basically they are E, B, A, John and Mary call. E, B, not A, John and Mary call. E, not B, A, John and Mary call. E, not B, not A, John and Mary call. Not E, B, and A, John and Mary call. Because at the end of the day, I'm getting about a subset of the world where John and Mary call. So I'm picking them. How many am I going to get in total when I'm done? Hey, you see which eight are there going to be. OK, so this is going to be the denominator. I'm going to add this 4P. There is a P of. I'm going to add this. Eight numbers that go with that, and that's going to be my denominator. What is my nominator? My numerator. How many are there in my numerator? I'm going to start writing them. That's right. I'm going to have four of them where the B is also on. So I'm going to have A, not A, John America, not E, B, A, John America, not E, B, not A, John America. I'm going to add this four. I'm going to divide it four. And this is the question that if I had gotten a call from John and Mary, and I wonder what the probability of my alarm ring, and I have magically filled this table, which we have already acknowledged, I don't know how to do, but this is the point of vision analysis and we're going to deal with in a minute. I would from this table solve this. And I would do it by, by basically taking all of the events of what the event of the end, okay, these are the things. The, the, if one of these things happen because I know John and Mary calls, so it's one of these eight. Okay. Which fraction of those I'm being right? Well, it's one of these four. The sum of these four. Divided by the sum of these eight is the ratio of probability of being in the general Is this is clear? Okay. So, so this is basically what is the point of this? This is what the next slide formally says, and what the next first slide formally says is that I will have computed one such a formula by adding a bunch of things and dividing them by a bunch of other things. We just did a concrete example, so hopefully this is completely clear by now. So um, So, okay, so yeah, this approach that we just so works. And, but there are a number of problems. Um, and the problems are what we are describing. Basically, there are many 
any such event, in this case there is only 32 because it's a tiny data set, but in the real world that could be a huge number, we'll see how many later. And many, many such events are extremely rare. In fact, they probably have never occurred and they're not going to occur in the life of my product because I'm assigning a value to every possible variable. And the more variables I have, which is a good thing to have in a data set, well, the more possible individual combinations there is, which means by the end, any particular combination is extremely rare. And this is a paradox because if I tell you, well, what is the probability that we'll be an earthquake within three feet? The, the epicenter of the earthquake is going to be within three feet of where I'm standing now. And it's going to happen exactly 33 minutes and 27 seconds from now. And it's going to be of magnitude 8.772 in the Richter scale. And it's going to be at the depth of 7,323 meters. What's the probability of that? The answer is, you know what? Virtually zero. Okay, but if I do that for every single step, all of them are virtually zero. And if you say, well, okay, they're all zero, we're all okay, there are no earthquakes in San Francisco. So you see that uh, when you add a huge number of almost zeros, there is an uncertainty here. And if we could go be more precise and in the limit, but this is not in the limit, this is a finite case. But even in the finite case, there is an uncertainty, which means you cannot make the prediction that earthquakes are unlikely because a particular one of these numbers is tiny. Yes, it's any one of these numbers is tiny, but it's none of them that I'm adding up in numerators and denominators. And this is crucial to understand. So, basically, there are many such events, and I need to estimate their probabilities in some meaningful way. I can't just say, well, it's almost zero. Almost zero doesn't count because I have to add them up, and I need to come up with a number which is not going to be almost zero by the end. So, I'm going to be making a prediction of all these things. Even if somehow I was able to solve these total problems, in the real world I would have to be adding tons of numbers for a prediction which would make my prediction very expensive if I was depending on my problem. But I mean, if I had to spend half a second of computation to make a prediction, this is a very expensive prediction in the real world for many problems. I mean, for some it's acceptable, but for some it's not. For some things, I mean, anyway. The point is, this is a number of real world problems, which means that even in my tiny problem, I'm, I'm running into these problems, even in my little alarm problem which is a toy. Well, this is called the course of dimensionality. Uh, basically, it tells me what we just saw, basically, the number of potential, the number of events when the number of rows is exponential in the number of events, uh, in the number of variables. In fact, it's equal to the product of the number of values, right? Because how many entries are there in total? Here, well, if there are five variables, there are Two times two times two times two times two times so before. But if each variable could take more than two values, it would be four times four times four if there were four values. Or what? And yes, okay, you can subtract one because they have to add up to one, that's really not going to make much of a difference, except for our analysis later. But even if you have ten binary variables, you're already at a thousand different numbers you have to estimate, most of which are extraordinarily rare and they have never happened. So how do you deal with this? How do you make a statistically significant predictions later? Right? Because not only do you need to come up with the numbers, they need to be statistically significant. So how am I going to estimate in a statistically significant manner the probability that there is an earthquake and a burglary and John doesn't call? How am I going with a statistically significant estimate of such a number? So this is the whole point of this discussion. So this is the whole point of Bayesian analytics. The key aspect here is what is called independence. Um, and this is the crux of what we're learning today. So this is the intent, I mean, everything that we've seen until now is background so that we can understand what we are going to see now. So that I can use this formula with a how to explain what they mean, what I mean. So basically, we're going to use the idea that in the world, even though things are all related, they're related in ways that allow me to simplify my joint probability distribution. In the most extreme case that never really happens, we have what is called independence. Uh, independence is a probability term that you probably have all seen before. Um, and basically, what, when, when I say two variables are independent, what intuitively I'm trying to say is, you know what? My guess about the value of this other variable is not influenced by my knowledge of this variable. So I, it's worth nothing to me to know the value of this variable. I'm not going to change my prediction of it. And that's what I mean by that is they're independent. Formally, what I mean is my belief about the value that A will take doesn't depend on the value of B. So basically, 
you can get a value of b. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get exactly the same distribution for a, uh, whether for any value of b, these are again, this is a, I'm using this in the distribution sense of these are variables. So basically, for every possible value of a, the probability that a will take that value is basically the same regardless of which value b takes. By the way, if this is true, then this is true, and vice versa. Those all these statements, they are equivalent, they mean the same thing. And by the way, this is the formulation you may have seen originally as a young kid on probability, which basically says the two variables are independent if the joint probability distribution is the same. Basically, the probability that both happen is the probability that the first one happens, plus the probability that the second one happens. These three statements are the same. And by the way, if I ask you to prove how, how you know that, by now you have, you're equipped with the mathematics required to do this, which are very simple. You can use base theorem and basically use something like p of a, b equals p of a given b times p of b, and basically show that p of a given b is the same thing as p of a, and then you have that basically p of a times b is p of a given b, which is p of a, you see, for example. By the way, what if you can prove this, this is true, and this is the meaning of independence. Now this never happens in the real world. For example, if I ask you what's the problem that you think the air, the face of the moon is correlated to earthquake, the answer is yes, of course it is correlated to earthquake because the moon has gravitational bacterial attraction on the earth, it changes the tides, the tides change the pressure on the mantle and basically on the crust and they, they change the probability of the earthquake, that change on the face of the moon. So there's very few things in the world that are independent and this is not very helpful. However, this is important to understand because, uh, well, okay, before I go to go, this is the slide that I had before I go to go to what I going to say. Okay, there are a few things that truly are independent. Uh, although I would argue whether they are, like consecutive tosses of the same coin are independent. Assuming your arm is not getting tired when you toss them, assuming you're not developing the regular stress motion, assuming that you're not somehow optimizing your motions as you start crossing coins better and better you start. Anyway, assuming a number of things which are reasonable but they break in the limit and, and honestly in the real world they break, uh, you can assume that uh, consecutive tosses are independent. Consecutive, consecutive draws from a deck of cards in which you are replacing and reshuffling the deck uh, are independent, but if you are not reshuffling the deck, they clearly are not independent. Once you take a car out, the next one, it cannot be that one, so it has to be something else. So clearly, you have changed the probability of everything else. So independence is very powerful. Um, you will see, basically, because it allows us to break the system into, into pieces, which is the crux of what the analysis is going to allow us to do. We'll see in a second. Um, so, but it is very rare. So it typically, yes, if you can find independence, it is. But typically, you don't collect data that is independent in your data sets because if you thought these variables were independent of the things you care about, why are you collecting them? So, so typically there is nothing independent in the data you collect. So what ends up happening in the real world is that you have conditional independence. Conditional independence is something in which you can say two variables are independent once we observe a third aspect. Going back to the phases of the moon, could you say, well, earthquakes are not independent of the phases of the moon? But earthquakes are independent of the phases of the moon given the height of the tide. Because, well, the reason the phase of the moon influenced my earthquake was through the, through the tide. So if I know the tide itself, then it doesn't matter. I may, know, I may not know the phase of the moon because there are clouds occluding it. So the point being that when things act through another one, knowing the one through which they act means that I don't need to know the original cause, for example. That's, an exa uh, that's a particular example of conditional independence. In general, if I can say that given a piece of knowledge, these two things are independent, and they are saying these two things are independent, uh, conditionally independent given the set. So this actually arises infrequently in practice. We're going to see it in a second. We're going to go back to our alarm network, and we're going to suddenly see that our alarm network that was impossible is tractable. And the goal point of the alarm network is a very small example, but it's sufficiently close to reality that hopefully you would understand how you could model real data. So adding conditional independence assumptions to a model is a common form of injecting prior knowledge. In fact, this is the most common form of injecting prior knowledge. Today, we're going to build prior independence assumptions from an intuitive understanding. The state of the art Bayesian analysis tries to learn conditional independence from data. This is a very hard thing, uh, and it typically requires uh, 
people who are exper experiencing vision analysis using the right kind of software and interacting. So it is very difficult to detect. Again, it is possible from to, to determine condition independence from the data, but it is hard. Uh, and this is the art of vision analytics. Um, because in the real world, you don't have intuitions like the ones we're going to use in our learning. One of the challenges is that typically you're using variables that are a lot more abstract. Right? Like here I'm having variables that have beautiful names and everybody has a feeling and intuition of what John, what does it mean when John calls, when Mary calls. In reality, I mean, a lot of the, the vision analysis that I've done has to do with modeling genetic networks for gene expression, trying to understand how a particular pattern of genes expressing over time will influence the progression of a particular disease. Um, I don't have an intuition, oh, well, I think P53 given H42, so I don't really have an intuition that allows me to say that these two things are conditionally independent given the third. So I would like to discover that from my data, and as I say, it is possible, but I'm not covering that today because it goes beyond the basics. It, we will need a course on this. So, but, but even, I mean, we, we'll get enough. We'll get enough. So, these are, this is the formula that goes for conditional independence of events. These are, if you notice, these are the same formulas that I had before, except that I have added a C to the right of the conditional symbol. So before, I had P of E, for full independence of A and B, I had P uh, is independent of P, if P of A equals P of A and B. P uh, a, a is independent of B given C if P of A given C is equal to P of A given B. Notice that in particular, the full independent, there is always things about the world that you know that you're not modeling, right? We are, I mean, typically you don't include it in your model. And by the way, I'm currently in San Francisco. You don't say my city equals San Francisco is not the, one of the variables in your model, even though it's a data type. The point is simply that there are always plenty of variables to the right of the bar that you don't bother with. So in this case, what we're saying is sometimes there are variables that you want to explicitly list at the right of the bar. There is always plenty of the state of the world to the right of the bar that you don't care. And that one we don't write. Anyway, the point is, this is telling me that when this is true, what I'm saying is A is independent of B given C. That doesn't mean A and B cannot influence each other. It only means if I know C, then I will not, learning way will not help me predict A. However, if I don't know C, Learning thing B will still help me think about A, and we are going to see this in the hands-on. We're going to do this, and this is crucial. And I think a feeling and understanding of how these things work is crucial. But we'll see in a second later. Okay, all of these equations are equivalent. Again, you could go through the map of you understand now what these expressions actually mean. These are because these are variables. These are events, so these are variables. So you can apply the theorem and, and produce the numbers and show that this is true. Uh, what I say, this is, this is not always true. This is true if. For a particular set of variables, if A and B are independent given C, that's not in general. So A and B are typically not independent given C. But if they are, this is true. And if this is true, then you can show that this implies this, this implies this, this implies this. They are all conditions are equivalent. So, are there any questions on this? Okay. So, something that is important in the, in the real world is what is called conditional independence of variables. So we've been talking about conditional independence of events. Um, if when an event takes the form of variable assignment, basically, in addition to that, we can have a more powerful idea, which is also relatively common in practice and is very useful, which is called conditional independence, conditional independence of variables. What do I mean by conditional independence of variables? So basically, what I mean is Two variables A and B are condition independent, even other variables C, if basically any of these conditions hold. What these conditions tell me when you go read them is the same thing as I had before for events, except that it tells me the formula is true no matter which values I assign to my variables. So it's not only this is true when A takes this variable, uh, when A takes A sub alpha and C takes C sub gamma and B takes B sub beta, this is true. Okay, well, that's an event. That's the formula I had before. But if this is true for any possible value I A alpha I could give to A, any possible value of C gamma I could take to C, give to C, and any possible value of beta I could give to B, then the variables themselves are independent, not just the event. We're going to see a concrete example of this that is going to make this very clear. This is crucial. But the reason I'm not insisting on this is because this is the, the formal definition, and then we're going to go a concrete example, and that's going to make it very clear. So these are formally the same expressions as before, 
But again, now what I have are full events. So basically, the, the variables are in full variables. So the, I'm saying now the variables are conditioned independent because each other given something. What does the upside down A mean? It means for all. So I mean, this is true for any for every possible value I could give to A. For every possible value I could give to C, for every possible value I could give to B. Before we said, well, if there is some value for which this is true, then these two events are conditionally independent given the solver event. But if this is true for every possible value this variable can take, then I can say that variable A is conditionally independent of variable B given variable C. And by the way, I'm using this formula, but any of these three are mean the same thing. They are the same formula, including in three different ways. And this is crucial. Um, by now, if you haven't seen this before, I would not fully expect you to grasp the implications of this. But I'm not concerned because we're going to see a complete example in our alarm, which starts is going to draw this to a, we are going to instead of having A's and B's and Bs and stuff, we're going to have John and Mary and the alarm and the earthquake, and suddenly all of this will make sense. So are we in time ways? We are doing awesome time ways. Great. Um, I'm going to skip this example. I don't know, maybe. Okay. These are conditional, uh, conditional independence of variables. Uh, you know what? I'm skipping this example. Boring. Okay. I'm going to move to this. Um, so, this is just a quick recap of the formulas that what they mean before because I'm going to go to a little bit of math in which we're going to try basically we just saw this theory of, of what we've okay what we've seen until now is this joint probability distribution we have been talking about evidence uh, sorry about independence and I'm going to try to put these two things together so to see how in practice I apply this whole issue of independence I've been talking to these issues of that I had before to solve this problem that I had before. The problem I'm trying to solve is, I don't know how to fill in these numbers. There are too many of them there, and most of them are too unlikely. So remember, I have this, what we've already seen, basically, the problem, what it means by conditional probability. We already have seen from Bayes' theorem that basically the joint probability of A and B being A, the probability of A happens and B happens is the same thing as the probability of A happens, given that B happens, and the probability of B happens. This was Bayes' theorem, one application of Bayes' theorem. It's also called the product rule. And it makes perfect sense. If you think about it, it's, okay, well, what do I need for A to happen and B to happen? These are events, not variables. What do I need for A to happen and B to happen? Well, what I need for both of them to happen is I need for A to happen, which will happen with probability P of A. Now, given that A has happened, I need to also be to happen. Okay, well, how likely is that to happen? Well, that's the probability of B given that A has already happened. So basically, this is always true, that the probability that A will happen and B will happen is the product of the probability that A will happen times the probability that B will happen given that A has already happened. So this will always be true. And this is called the product rule. And this is, again, this is something that was intuitively obvious before from our definition, right? We define probability of A given B as Hey, this is the cases where, among those cases where B happened, cases where A also happened. We define this as basically here, we saw it, right? We, we divided the cases where basically this happened in the bottom, and then the cases where this happened, and this also happened in the top. This is exactly what I'm writing here in a more general form. Well, if I move this thing to the right, I'm just saying the same thing. So there is nothing new here, but we're putting the same thing. Now, the interesting magic is about to happen now. We're getting very close to what I would consider the crux of this. I could go through that reasoning before and extend it dramatically. So now, what is the probability that these are events, not variables? What is the probability that this will happen and this will happen and this will happen and this will happen? Well, is the probability that the first one will happen, the marginal of the probability, the whole world? Will... Now, given that this has already happened and already seen it, what's the likelihood that B will also happen in addition? Well, that's P of B given A. Okay. Well, given now, okay, by the time I reach here, the product of these two is telling me the probability these two have B and A both have happened. Well, there was a probability that C, C will happen on top of that. Well, because on top of that, because it's related, well, that's the probability of C will happen in given that A has already happened and B has already happened. You can see how this comes in. Now, one interesting thing that you by now might be thinking is, well, 
to fill in this data set, this data, I only need, a, this is a very simple data set. I just need to count how many times I've seen A, how many times I haven't seen A. So it's just, I mean, it doesn't matter how, the total thing may be extremely rare, but the number is easy to compute for my data set. No matter what the variable A is, some will be having, some will have some other value. Basically, each of them will have some value, and I can compute it. Now, as I move forward, it gets more complicated. To fill in this table, I only need to look at these two columns of my data set. Well, that's still seems simple because there are not going to be that many combinations. By the time I'm at the, bottom, I'm at the end, I haven't gained anything. Because to fill in this table, I need to look at basically all the variables. Okay, well, back to my original problem. I cannot fill in this table in any meaningful way because many of these things happen. Many of these things on the right haven't actually happened. So how can I say that I'm thinking in ABC when I've never seen ABC? By the time I have sufficiently large number of variables. So this, are, this was a good idea, but it's it doesn't quite have, it doesn't quite work yet. By the way, I picked this order of my events, but I could have put my events in a different order, and I could have basically expanded, it's the same, this is the same variable, but I expanded it so well. C has already happened. What's the chance that B will happen on top of that? Well, that's B of B, B of B given C. What's the chance will A will happen on top of that? Well, that's times P of A given A C. What's the chance that D will happen on top of, the fact that those three have already happened yet? So you can see that basically I could decompose this joint distribution, which is the formula, into this product. And by the way, when you say, well, what does this product mean? These are, these are events, I mean, I mean these are, in this case, they are just numbers because these are events. If these were variables, well, this would just be product of functions, and those are well defined. So there's nothing mysterious here so far. So basically, the idea is basically the chain rule uh, allows me to write a function as a product of other functions. One thing that is interesting to observe is I haven't really solved my problem. In fact, I've just been doing cool algebra. I didn't know in algebra when I was cool in the day um, but, but I haven't changed the number of total parameters that I need to in my distribution, as we will see in a second. Um, I haven't reduced the complexity to find out what those numbers actually are. So I actually haven't gained anything. Yet, however, I have, is I have, what I have gained is that, um, actually, let's go through this. This is not a random set of variables. This is earthquake, a burglary, the alarm ringing, John leaving me a voicemail, Mary leaving me a voicemail. So, I could choose in this order. I could decompose them. By the way, how many independent parameters are, how many numbers independently are in this, in this formula? So this is, a, this, is a, this is an expression, it's a function, it, it takes two values, earthquake was yes, earthquake was no, I need to produce a number for each of those two cases. How many independent numbers are here? I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing one, but I'm, but I'm seeing one. What else I'm hearing? Or nothing? Anybody who care to venture? Okay. Do we understand what this expression, this chunk means here? Okay, this is a function. It takes two values. E equals true means an earthquake is happening. E equals false, an earthquake is not happening. How many parameters does this function take? How many numbers do I need to compute from my data set to fill in this function? One. Because once I know that it's happening, the one minus that is the other. Correct. How many do I need to fill in this function? I hear one, I hear two. Two. Well, what are they two? Then let's say that there are two for the sake of discussion. What would those two be? In English, probability that would be happening. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Probability. probability happening and the likelihood of B given E. Well, the two numbers that I need are much simpler than that. They're more straightforward, right? I mean, yes, I need two, and the two numbers I need. Okay, first of all, I need to be able to, be able to answer four questions from that function, but there are only two independent parameters. So this is P of B given E. And basically the question is, if E is true or E is false, B is true and B is false. Now, what I need to, this is a function that these ones are basically, if E is true, what is the probability that B is true? If E is true, what is the probability that B is false? Well, if this number is X, so there are four numbers here, right? The number the probability that B is true if E is true. Basically, the probability that a burglary is happening and an, uh, given that an earthquake is happening. The probability 
that a burglar is happening even that an earthquake is not happening. The probability that a burglar is not happening even that an earthquake is happening, and the probability that the burglar is not happening even that an earthquake is not happening. So these are the parameters I need to fill in. But how many independent parameters do I need to put in here? How many numbers? So if I put x here, what do I put here? What do I put here? What do I put here? Is this clear to everybody? So basically, to fill in this, so here I have one parameter, which I need to estimate from my data set, historical alarms and stuff. Here I have two. How many do I have here? I hear four, but I hear you take low probability of conviction. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get four probability, at least four different people before I will take four of them. Four. Four. Okay. And now I need to hear six. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so I need four, but which four do I need? Okay, so basically I need for every possible case of evidence to answer this question. So I need to. If there is an earthquake and there is a burglary, is there an alarm yes or no? That's one number. If there is an earthquake and there is no burglary, is there an alarm yes or no? Well, that's another number. If there is no earthquake, but there is a burglary, is there an alarm, yes or no? That's a third number. If there is neither of them, is there an alarm, yes or no? So that's a fourth number. Right? So basically, for every combination of these, I need one of these. And the reason I only need one is because it can only take two values. So if one, you give me one, the other one is one minus that one. If this took more than two values, it would require more numbers. How many parameters do I need here? Right. For every combination of these, I need to know if John called me yes or no. And how many parameters are there here? So how many is the total number of parameters that I have? Right, so I have gained nothing out of all of this exercise. <clears throat> but now, and this is the most valuable question you'll answer today. What would be reasonable to assume here? How could I simplify this? I'll, 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 I'll hear random things and I'll write them down. Here, I'm going to spend as much time until you all come up with all the answers, so I'm going to wait. So you can start telling me what you believe. What would be reasonable? You've never seen the data set, so I'm, I'm, I'm appealing to your intuition. Normally, I would be asking to your data set, but in this case, I'm going to appeal to your intuition. What do you think you're going to find? Say one of them are independent. Say one of them. That some of them are independent. Yeah, I want the specifics. That's correct. That's correct. Now I want to hear the. I, I want to listen all of them. So I'm going to wait until you all come up with all of the things that you think are independent. So I, I'm ready to start hearing. There are tons of them, so I need to start hearing them. How do I get the beginning? Say this one. Maybe like given any value of EB, the likelihood of the two people calling are basically independent. Like Okay, so you're telling me that the probability of Mary calling doesn't depend on whether John is yeah, calling clear. given an EBA. Yeah, clear John out of that. So okay, so I agree, we can clear John out of that. Because what he's telling me is, hey, if the earthquake is happening and the burglary is happening and the alarm is ringing. Basically, whether John calls or not, Mary will not change her behavior. In fact, she doesn't even know if John calls or not. So she could not possibly, so the probability of she calling could not possibly depend on the probability of John calling because she doesn't know that given the disease. So, so she cannot possibly know. So basically, we can immediately say probability of M given EBAJ equals P of M given EBA. If that, if we, the two, and what I'm saying is, the two numbers will be the same when John is true. When John is false, these numbers will be the same. So I don't need to specify, oh, give me one when John is true. Give me one when John is false. Well, they are the same, so just give me, it doesn't matter. OK, more things that you think are reasonable. Or what are you think are reasonable? Earthquake and burglary. Yes. So let's assume, and this is a very reasonable thing. If we expect that burglaries are a planned event, now, I'm, I'm going to say these things because you can see the challenges in the real world. Well, a burglar and an earthquake is independent. Well, are there opportunistic burglars? Oh, there's an earthquake, the, all the alarms are ringing anyway, I'm going in, nobody. But the reality is, if you assume that burglaries are a planned event and not opportunistic, then basically probability of B given A is the same thing as probability of B, meaning they, they are independent. And I think that's reasonable. I agree. I think that if you assume they're a they this is reasonable. OK? Now, for this one, we need to remember that I 
Say in English that John called me when he here. What this basically tells me is that if the alarm is ringing, it doesn't matter if there is an earthquake or not, because John will call me if he hears my alarm. Now, this is because of what I said. You say, hey, maybe call me, John will call me to my office to say there is an earthquake. But in my model, I have said John will only call me because he hears the alarm. So in reality, I could say that the probability of John calling me given all of these possible scenarios is, you know what, at the end of the day, the only thing that's going to make, yes, this, there are eight possible numbers you have to give me, but in reality, there's only two cases. Either the alarm is ringing, at which point the number is the same no matter what these two values, variables take, or the alarm is not ringing, and then the number is the same no matter what the four values taken. So I don't need eight values, I don't need two. I need whether John, the probability of John calling me giving the alarm, and probability of John giving me giving the not alarm. And just because it's the same if, if the earthquake is calling and the earthquake is, not, if the earthquake is happening or it's not happening, the earthquake is happening or it's not happening, it's the same. By that logic, there is one more that you should be able to guess. Mary yes, what would I say about that? So we have already did, said, we have already said it was this, but I can say more. What can I say? It only depends on the alarm. Right, it only depends on the alarm. Basically, basically now, or more precisely, it is conditionally independent of these two giving the alarm. Because in reality, if, if, if the alarm wasn't broken, there might be still some correlations. I will see this in a second in the exercise. But if the alarm is working, basically, whether my memory calls or not depends on the alarm. So if I make these assumptions, which I believe are the ones I made when I was coming up with this around, um, then I can make this simplification. Well, how many parameters do I have now? Okay, how many are there here? Right, so that's a total of 10. Not only is a much smaller number, it's a number that has two very interesting properties. One of them is none of these things is extraordinarily rare, at least compared to the ones before. So there is likelihood that I can estimate them. Second, to fill in this number, say I'm picking any one of them at random, any for each of these two parameters, I need a data set that contains these two variables. I don't care if my data set has the other variables. This means I can fill in these numbers from a data set that is different from the data set I used to fill in this number. Because maybe I have a data set with somehow I collected it using some mechanism where I basically have John and the alarm ringing, but I kind of don't have anything else. Well, um, I could use a data set, I can use basically different data sets to fill in different chunks of my model. Because now, like before, where by the end, everything was just, I want to pick a data set where everything is present, because I made this assumption, like, well, you know what? I need different data sets for different things. And this is how allow me to basically use different data sets potentially to fill in different chunks of my model. So I might not have a data set, well, you know what? I don't have a data set where I put these earthquakes at the same time with the alarms. And the, you know, or with the, I don't, I don't have a data set with the earthquakes and Mary calls simultaneously. I don't need such a data set. I mean, yes, I need a data set where the alarm, the earthquakes, and the blur rates are related because I need it for this table. But for other things, I don't need such a data set. So this is already a very interesting part of the idea. And the second one is none of these numbers becomes infinitesimal anymore. Even if I have hundreds of variables, any one of the, if I had a hundred variables, I would have a hundred such products. By the end, the, the product of all them would be tiny. But any one of the numbers that is the numbers I need to estimate from my data set can realistically be estimated, even if I don't have a ton of data. And even if the combination is exceedingly rare, the individual factors are not. They are reasonable. So I will see later a few more ways to deal with that. But the point is that now I can come up with a statistically significant reasonable measure of any particular of these extraordinary rare events by making this assumption. And well, this basically allows me to solve my problem because these are the, the numbers that we can follow. Yes? So, uh, if you come to such a reduced form, even if you add a different ordering of uh, of uh, writing the joint uh, probability equation. No. So, that's a very good question. Um, it, this this requires a very cleverly chosen order of the variables because I knew what. I knew what was, make, what was going to make sense. I said, okay, these ones are going to be independent of this one, so I need, the, I need them to appear in the right form in a factor. If I pick the wrong factor, if I pick the wrong decomposition, I cannot do it. 
And this goes back to why this is not the trivial problem in the real world with real data where you don't have this intuition. Here, I could, by using intuition, say, okay, let's pick up an order where I can say that given this one is going to be independent of most of them given one, so I can remove all of those. There is a task. Can this be discovered from data? Yes, but as I was saying before, picking the right order and choosing the right things is true. And the right order is crucial because if, if, if the variables don't appear in the right order, you cannot apply these independence assumptions because these are independent assumptions of variables, right? So I'm, the whole variable is independent. I'm saying, given that I know whether the alarm is ringing or not, I don't care about the individual values. So it's not just an independence of events, but it's an independence of variables that I'm highly listed here. So yeah, the order is crucial. But if you pick the right order, and you identify the, the probabilities, the, the right independence assumptions, then you can come up with a form that basically is much simpler, where the number can actually be statistically significantly estimated. So, uh, could we further reduce the number of events? Um, the answer is yes. We could actually reduce the number of parameters from 10 to 9 or through a reasonable assumption. Um, this is a this is a, we call this an advanced concept. So I will I will we'll, we'll brainstorm and see if anybody comes up with the right intuition of where it goes. I put that like before where I said I need to hear all the different proceed. At this point, this is a tricky one. Can anybody guess what one more thing we could say? Someone hinted at it before, but we got the time because it was tricky. Exactly the first one that came up in the previous discussion, but we didn't know how to move forward with. You remember, you, you, were, you were proposing but you weren't able to formalize but you remember what you were trying to say. I do not remember what I was saying. So you were trying to say that because of the physics of the alarm, yes, of course, do you think the alarm is more likely to ring if there is both an earthquake and a burglary? No, either one makes the other relative. I would say no. Probably the idea is, if you think of the alarm as a motion sensor, well, the more things that are jiggling the alarm, the more likely the alarm is to ring. That, again, this depends on the physics of your device. Uh, but this is a typical thing, uh, we'll, we'll see later with the kind of problems where this is typically used. But typically when an event has multiple causes, sometimes you can say, well, you know what, these causes are additive in some way. Like, I mean, if I kick the alarm, there is some chance that it will not detect it. But if I kick it twice, the chance that it will not detect it are I mean, the more times I kick it, the more likely it is that it will ring. Right? That's the intuition here we're trying to capture. Now, an earthquake and a burglary are not the same thing, but I would expect that somehow the alarm will ring even when there's no earthquake and no burglary, for reasons that are unexplained, or more precisely, for reasons that are not modern. The alarm will ring when there is an uh, burglary. The alarm will ring when there is an earthquake because it will also be jingle. And the alarm will ring even more when there is. OK, well, those are the four numbers I was just saying. So, OK, by the alarm depends. On, I mean, basically, the, the variable, the, the, the model that we had was uh, earthquake and burglary. So you say, you say four numbers. And what I'm trying to say is, in reality, one could model it as three by explaining that the causes are independent in a particular way. It depends on the nature of the sensor. Making this explicit is, is a tricky, is a little tricky. But eventually, what you end up happening is you end up having some of these models. And basically, what you're saying is. Uh, if the alarm's failure to detect a stimuli is independent of the other stimuli present, right? So the alarm failing to detect my kick, so well, there's a chance of 0.1%. 10% of the time, the alarm fails to detect the kick. Okay, well, if there are two kicks, what is the probability that it will fail? Well, intuitively, you think, okay, well, that's 0.1 times 0.1, right? Because if you didn't detect the first one, probably it's independent. It's like the coin tosses, right? So if you make this assumption, which depends on the physics of your alarm, and you could argue whether it's true on a particular device or not, um, and you make a couple more assumptions, then you basically could potentially, and this is basically a common, um, so this is called the noisy or, and basically, when you have multiple non-interacting causes, it's a reasonable assumption. So you think, hey, you know what? My alarm detects these things. When it detects each of them, is somehow independent of each other. So of course, the more, they are, the more stimulus they are, the more likely is the alarm will ring. So if you do that, you can actually model your distribution by just assigning one probability to each individual number. Okay, so and that will also bring down the number from 10 to 9. So at this point, um, I just want to finish this section before we go into the break, uh, which we're going to go basically in a minute. Um, 
by showing that this is our alarm example we saw it before I could the the composition I just described I could basically draw graphically what is this picture forget all the numbers for a second at the table just the picture what this picture is telling me is what my five factors look like it's telling me hey the joint probability distribution has five factors. How do I see that? Because my graph has five nodes. What are the five factors? Well, the five factors in this representation are a node given its parent. The five factors are from top to the bottom are P of B, P of E, P of A given EB, P of J given A, P of M given A. And I am reading this from this graph, right? B doesn't have any parents, E doesn't have any parents, Alarm has two parents, John Cos has one parent, Mary Cos has one parent. This is just a picture of the same mathematics. This picture is called a Bayesian network. In addition, so that from the picture, I know which decomposition I'm making. And it is easier, once you get familiar with technology, to make the decomposition from the picture than to make it in the abstract with, with expression. So nobody would actually do the math. But it's important to understand that the picture is just a representation of the math. So there is no magic in this picture. The arrows means what I am conditioning on in each factor. So I'm saying that to specify my joint probability distribution, I'm going to specify the marginal probability of burglary, the marginal probability of earthquake, the probability of alarm given burglary and earthquake, the probability that John calls given the alarm, the probability of Mary calls given the alarm. So what the arrows are telling me is how to do this picture. Because if I switch the order of the arrows, I would mean something different. But you can see that any uh, non cyclic directed graph will produce such a decomposition. So every, every graph represents a particular set of variable conditional independence assumptions. So from now on, instead of writing long formulas with lots of variables, I just draw pictures. But what I mean is the math behind. The picture without the math means nothing. Now, in addition, I could assign, as well, intuitively also, this also tells me which things, which parameters I need to represent. And these are the, the 10 parameters we saw before that I needed to specify. Of course, for every one true, I just, so basically I need the margin in here, so I need probability of probability equals true, and probability of probability equals false, which is one minus that. Probability of earthquake being true, and probability of earthquake being false, which is one minus that. The alarm for each of the possible values of the parent, the probability of it being true, and of course the probability of it being false is one minus that, one minus one minus one minus one, and for each of these. Is this picture clear? So this picture doesn't tell me anything new, but this is what most people who are talking about patient analysis will see. And this picture, once you understood the previous math, it's just the math in a way that is immediately you understand well, immediately after you have some practice, you understand what you're trying to say and how information is going to be able to flow. And we are going to do the hands-on in a minute after our break. But um, I think this is basically my last slide before the break. So, well, okay, so these are real examples. I'm not going to go with them because we're going to do the same hands-on. This is just to show you the view of the picture. And this is, and then eventually things get more complicated. This is a real scenario of one, these are genes, and basically at some point, let me just I'm going to slow down for a second. And it is worth going through that. So this is a, a very simple example in which this was also a toy, but basically you can see these are the marginals. Then you could say, hey, if I know that the person is a smoker, so basically these are variables in which you're trying to predict different chest uh, conditions, whether you could have basically, whether you have bronchitis or lung cancer or tuberculosis. This is a toy example. This is not real. Um, but anyway, you could set evidence by saying, hey, I know this is true. And then you could see how things change with respect to the base distribution. This is the baseline. This is which basically this is showing the marginals for every one of your network. Here you could say, hey, if this is true, give me the probability of everything else given true. So what's the probability of this situation being true or the, given that smoker is, et cetera, you could see that. Now, this is complicated. So in reality, you might want to compare. You can merge these two pictures by showing, for example, a representation like this, in which what you are showing is Okay, in the light blue, I have the marginals. This is in my whole data set, which fraction of the people have each of these situations by themselves. But then I want to compare multiple scenarios. So for example, here I'm comparing the scenario where I say, okay, compare the general population to the subpopulation of smokers. And as you can see, 
Well, clearly, that's what you're doing, and this one is in this particular for that. You can see how the numbers have changed. Okay, well, there is an increase of 15% in the probability of bronchitis, and of course, which of course, is, uh, these numbers are rounded up, but basically, so you can see these numbers have changed uh, compared to the numbers. You could compare two different subpopulations. Compare me, the subgroup of smokers and non-smokers. They don't will see more complicated things in the hands-on. You could start clicking. Now, when you get, when you get into this, you can start clicking too. Oh, what if this is true, and this is true, and this is not true? And then you could compare more people's lives. Um, yes, so. Uh, yeah, so this, this is what this means. Eventually, as your variables grow larger, you may use a visualization and say, well, you know what? Most of my variables are actually coming in ranges. So what I want to see is if I set something to very low, and you can see that from the thick border, okay. then you say, if, and the color says, if I set it to very low, what do I expect to, what do I expect to see in the rest of my data? So well, we're expecting some of this to grow, some of this was a, some prediction of the stock market. So it sort of works, but the problem with predicting the stock market is it sort of works most of the time, and then the data it doesn't give you so your money. So you can get it 5%, 5%, 5% every month, and then you lose 80% in, in your bacteria. Anyway. So the point being that when you have a large number of variables, you might want to use some form of color scheming. And then when you want to really understand well, what does this thing really mean, then you can start zooming in. And then you can see that by how one way to deal with numerical things is to put them into ranges. And we'll talk more about this later in the second half. And eventually, when things really, really, really get large, well, then, then you have something even smaller. And this is a genetic network. And you may not choose. For most users, I will, who do I care where the arrows go? The arrows are just a matter of representing how I am doing conditional joint distribution, which I have learned from my data anyway. Nobody cares. So here I do some form of clustering. So the reality is, because the arrows are still there, even though I'm not displaying them, the variables that are more heavily linked together are clustered together. And as a result, they are likely to move homogeneously together. So here you can see that once I say D56 to be in very high level of expression, then you can see what happens on the rest of the network, and you have for this data set to make sense, you actually need to understand what we're talking about. But basically, we are trying to predict how different genes move together. And then at some point, when you care about any one particular variable, you're going to still double I mean, open it up and see exactly what does happen in that case. So I think with that, we are basically going to, to take a break. So 10 minutes? 10 minutes, 10 minutes break. Perhaps more I'm going to start. I know the break has been short, but I want to keep a student late. Um, so, for my hands on tool, I'm going to use a tool called Unbase. You have the links on the website, uh, on the handout. It's a free tool, you can download it, you can write it, it runs on every platform. I start by saying I'm not familiar with this tool. I normally use a tool called uh, Fast Analytics by a company called Decision Q. And I am very biased because I actually do faster analytics. So uh, and the reason I'm not demonstrating is because it's not free and you cannot download it. And I'm not currently formally associated with the Shunky of an owner. Uh, this company has been running for like 15 years. It's been running for a long time. So I'm not currently associated with the day-to-day -day activities, but I'm the emergency chief kind of. So anyway, I'm going to use um, uh, Umbase. It works well for what we're going to try to do today. When it tries to learn from data, um, as I said, this is a hard problem, and, and I haven't actually tested it. And I don't think they, I mean, they don't specialize so much in that stuff. I need to be on my computer because I'm actually going to do a click on. Normally, I was going to do this by building things from scratch. I'm going to build a little tiny network from scratch, but then I'm going to start loading them because I was going to do, build all of them from scratch, but it takes me time to click. So in order to be by clicking and go through times and go through the more interesting things, I'm going to do. So to create a new network, you could basically just say new creation network here. Uh, I give it a name here, whatever, my test. I'm going to ask three nodes here. I could come to this node. I could call this node um, earthquake. I could have a description which I'm not going to bother. I would have, have to say that it has two states. I would say the states are Yes and no, and I could, sorry, I didn't click return, I guess, apparently. Earthquake, test, and we can just probably make it big enough. Okay, it has two states, and then I could call this guy, and I could call it burglary, and yes. Um, I could perhaps return, and then it 
schools also has to stay and like you know the BDS and no and then I can come to this and call this alarm I mean I'm not explaining anything because I think this is completely intuitive what I'm doing and it also has to stay to start yes and no and then I could start saying that I have to link that I have a, a link from here to here and suddenly you see that when I click on the alarm, now what is asking me is to fill the, to the conditional probability table, which has this for entries. So if everybody is yes, an earthquake is yes, what's the probability of alarm? Yes. And I would write a number, and then this one would be one minus that, and then I would write another number, and then I would divide on that, and I fill that, and I would have those two numbers filled, and then we would start looking in these two. Now, what I'm going to do is load this tiny network. So instead of me continuing doing that, I'm just going to load it so we can start moving on. So I'm going to leave this in a little corner here. Good. So I'm going to just say file open. And I have, I don't mind, not the directory of host open to be. Now I'm glad I actually did a um, um, burglary cause of the canal. And this is just little three nodes because I wanted to show you something. So first I want to show you what these nodes look like. So these are exactly the things that you saw. So probability of Berkeley, 1%. Probability of earthquake, 2%. In some, again, what these numbers mean is like, okay, in some amount of, in some period of time, right? So we haven't defined well, what is an earthquake, right? And we probably will have to have an earthquake of mine to so and so within this geographical region in this in a particular time frame. Okay. And then probability of alarm, I have filling my numbers. These are, these are numbers which are reasonable intuitively. But now we can start doing interesting inference. So when I do that, so this is my little tiny network. I'm going to make a bigger network later. I'm going to show you something called explaining it, which is interesting. So um, let me compile my network. That just means that. These are the marginal. These two numbers, because this, because these are these numbers are actually parameters. These are the numbers I enter. This is the marginal. This is not a number I enter anywhere. But this is like, in that particular time set, how likely is the alarm to ring? 1.61%. How do I know that? Well, I take in all my possible combinations of things, computing the joint probability distribution, and the sum of the four, so there are eight possible scenarios. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, no. Yes, no, yes. Yes, no, no. No, yes, yes. No, yes, no. No, no, yes. No, no, no. Right? So there are four possible cases. Here, what he's telling me is, of the four possible, of the four, of the four cases where how alarm equals yes, divided by the total eight cases is 1.61%. That, that came from my other problems, even though I didn't introduce that. But now I can start doing other forms of analysis. I can say, hey, what if I know a burglary is happening? So I mark 100%, and in this tool I have to press this button, and that changes my numbers. It's okay, well, what do I have now? It's immediately has computed probability of E given B equals true, probability of A, when A equals true or A equals yes, given B equals true. So this is what it's showing me now. So now it's showing me, before it was showing me the, by default the marginal, now it's showing me probability of E given B, probability of A given B, B equals true. So probability of capital A given little b, probability of capital A given little b, the capital E, capital A, given little b. Right. So, but I could make more complicated assumptions. So now I have an interesting question. But actually, no, let's not, let's not, no, let me get a different question. Let me, let, let me, let me reset. Let me start again. Now I say, I hear the alarm. So I hear the alarm. What do you expect when I run the software? What do you expect to happen in these two? So now I'm going to compute probability of burglary given alarm, probability of earthquake given alarm. So I don't know if these things have happened, but I'm hearing the alarm. What do I expect the moment I click on the button to run the mathematics and do the multiplications? What do I expect to see in these numbers? Just go up here, okay? What about up here? Just go up here too. Yeah. So yes, this is this is what I expect to go up and it will happen. Yeah. The numbers have gone up. But now imagine I hear on the radio that an earthquake has happened. So I'm, this is my current situation. I'm hearing the alarm. Uh, and I hear on the radio that the alarm or earthquake has happened. Do you think, or actually, raise your hand if you think that this is going to change the probability of burglary? Okay. 
Okay, I have three hands thinking that the probability of burglary is going to, ch to change. Okay, raise your hand if you don't think it's going to change. I have one that doesn't think it's going to change. Two. Okay. Well, I'm very interested in the remainder scenario because, because okay, so I have five people who have given me yes or no. I would like to hear the other option of one to think the alarm is going to blow up. <laughs> okay, let's play again because I need to. Yeah. Okay, raise both hands if you are unsure. Okay, so we have three people who are unsure. Okay, now all those who of you who are sure, who will, who are the yeses again? Who are the noes? Okay, those of you who haven't raised a hand at all at this point, what do you think? I want to doubt. Okay, okay, this is interesting. Okay, well the answer is actually interesting. The answer is yes, and this is called explaining it well. The alarm is ringing, so the numbers went up. But if there is an earthquake, that explains why the alarm is ringing. So I expect the project for to go down. And that we didn't see. And by the way, we will have to do the math. And, and if, I mean, if you do the math, you will see. But by the way, the project of Ferrari went down. Not quite as low as if I hadn't heard the alarm, but almost. Because the reality is, these two events are both so rare that the moment I know one of them has happened, the other one basically is like, you know what, this is too easy. Wait, why am I hearing the alarm? Yes, it could be a burglary, but at the same time. No, this is, of course, because of the numbers I put in. If I have, and because basically the numbers that I put in will have this effect. However, it is important to remark that um, I'm going to open another network on this side. It's called a naive based model. Um, so even in this very simple scenario, you're getting very interesting behavior, right? So, so you can see that I'm not going to find. Oh, you know, okay, fine. Okay. Okay. This is a different model in which I have the error going the other way. Because why not? Now, this this, 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 this is just mathematics. This is telling me that I'm decomposing the joint probability distribution of these three variables into three products. P of A, P of B given A, P of A D, E given A. How many parameters did this model have independently? Forgetting about the trick about the noisy or. This whole model. So how many independent numbers did I need to specify to specify the model, the, the, this model here? So I had three tables. How many numbers in this table? In the original table. Remember the original table? The, hmm? So in this, in this table there are two numbers, but there's only one independent, right? Because one of them is probability of burglary, the other is probability of not burglary, which is one of that. In this table there is one number. In this table there is four numbers, which are independent. There's a total of eight. Alarm. If burglary and earthquake, alarm if burglary and earthquake, alarm if burglary, etc. So they said all six. This model has five, right? So probability of alarm, yes or no, that's one parameter. And each of these is two. Probability of burglary, if alarm, yes. Probability of burglary, if alarm, no, that's two. Probability of earthquake, alarm, yes. Probability of alarm. So this model has five. It's a different model. I can do many things that are, I can fill in the numbers. For example, I can fill in numbers. Let me execute the model to show you. That I'm going to show that this is tricky. Basically, if I go and say, well, I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you that this is a complicated world. So I fill in my numbers so that these numbers will be the same. So I made my numbers so the marginals are the same. This was easy. How did I do that? Well, I knew what these marginals were. I built this model. I know what these marginals were. So first, I improved these two numbers as parameters, right? So how did I do that? Well, I basically opened this table. I went back to the very here. Table, I chose this part of this node, and I entered exactly the numbers here that I wanted to see. <laughs> because what I need to, what is asking me is the marginal, so I just entered these numbers. Now I needed to enter these two numbers in burglary. <coughs> so how did I choose these four numbers? Well, very simple. I came here and I said, okay, when alarm is yes, the numbers I want to see are 58.35 and 41.65, right? This is the numbers I want to see. To get the same model. Okay, well, then the numbers like when the alarm is yes, the numbers I enter are these, so I will see them. The same thing by clicking on no, the same thing. So I, I can fill in all these numbers to do this. As a result, these two models seem to behave 
very similarly. So when I execute them, and I click on the one just on this model 2, and I run it, I get the same number, because of course the numbers are going to However, and this goes back why this is a difficult world, if I now click on, like, let's go back to before how we did this before. So the alarm rings. Let's, let's stop this. Let's, let's, let's clear both of them. Let's see. Let's do this. Um, clear, 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 clear. The beliefs. Reset beliefs. This. Okay, so my values are the same. If I click on yes, we see what we just saw. Basically, both of them go up. If I click on yes, both of them go up. They go up by the same amount. Okay, they go up by the same amount. However, these two nodes are not the same and their differences are tricky. When I click on burglary, sorry, an earthquake, as I did before, for example, and I execute, I see the probability of burglary go down virtually to zero as we uh, for explaining it. With. But this model is different. This model doesn't say that burglary and earthquake are conditionally independent given alarm. This is a different model. In fact, in fact, this model is saying, the one on the right is saying that earthquake and burglary are independent given alarm, which basically means when I click on yes, nothing changes. So for those of you who guessed before that nothing would change, the answer is we're modeling in a way that things change because in our data set, this is the behavior we wanted, this is the behavior we hopefully have learned from the data. If we had modeling like this, we wouldn't be getting this kind of prediction. Now that this makes, makes a huge difference, because I'm making a very different prediction now that I would have made different. And if I was making decisions based on this, it wouldn't matter. Even though it looked like when I started looking at pairwise variables, it was looking like everything was the same, it wasn't. Now here I have intuition I can test. When my variables start sounding like H23, P54, this gets very challenging, because am I modeling the right thing? It's a very hard question. So, I mean, of course you have to use your data to, to answer that question, but what I'm trying to say is it becomes very tricky to answer that question because you have to look at multiple combinations. Okay, so given that, um, now it so happened that the model of our alarm was correct. That's why we discussed about the physics of the sensor, how the sensor works, how we did. Because of that, we chose to model it this way, and because of that, we're getting the behavior we wanted. When, so you can either use reasoning a priori because you understand the physics and the nature of your processes very well, or if you're learning from data, your variables will have clear names that you have intuitions for, then things get trickier. And, well, uh, you will need to learn the structure from data and the condition and dependence from data, and that is tricky. I am going to now open one more file. Uh, this is the full network. We could play with it. Uh, I'm going to execute it. We could start doing the kind of reasoning that we did before as well. Okay, in reality, I'm not at the office. I, I'm not at home. I don't know if the alarm is ringing. What I know is that John calls. So what happens when John calls? Well, you can see different numbers go up, and you can compute all of this. And this gives you a feeling, by the way, I'm showing this example because you know, all these variables are clear. You know, anything they're going to go in the real world. By now, hopefully, this sounds realistic enough that you can transpose it to whatever your domains of work are. It's starting to show. We, we have, I mean, you can hopefully put the math together with it. Now, what happens if that is, now John left me a more boy uh, missed call, okay, well, probability of burglary, which is at the end of the day, what I really want to care, care has gone up to 13.33%. Do I go home or not? Well, that depends on, we'll see in a second of what that depends on. Now, what if Mary also calls me, my other neighbor? I execute that. Okay, well, no probability of burglary. Notice that this is what I was telling you about the aliens coming before. Okay, both of them have called. Even some signal that show there is a burglary because the reality is a burglary is sufficiently rare, or even or an earthquake is even more rare in this case, that even if they both call, actually it's not because the earthquake is more rare, it's because the earthquake is likely to trigger them. But the point is even if they both call, I may still not be very sure that there is a burglary. And it goes back to how sure am I at this spaceship as well. This is such a rare thing that this is an alien spaceship with microscopic aliens from Alpha Centauri, that the reality is, in spite of evidence, and like, your evidence probably is not going to tip us that much in that direction. So, and this kind, of, this kind of shows you how priors and all of the information is playing to that. One interesting thing about Bayesian models is that, at the end of the day, the goal of Bayesian model, of any kind of modeling, is decision making. You can extend this kind of model very nicely to something called decision diagram. 
Uh, open. Okay, so this is, this is my network on the left. The same numbers as before, treating the same. This is what is called a decision node, which in this particular tool, it just means it can take two values and it's not going to be filled in from the software. It's something that you would get to choose. I can either go home or not go home. It's going to depend on this. I, intuitively, I'm saying it depends on these two tools. Um, but in reality, it doesn't matter. I, I can operate and you will see it just has two values, go home, not go home. Then, there is, based on whichever I decide here, I will either get this contract, but I'm on the, the priority of me getting the contract will depend on whether I go home or not. If I stay on the phone with the guy I'm trying to make a sale, maybe I'll make a sale with 80% chance and I won't. If I go home, the probability I'll make a sale is lower than the 50%. So this is back to it. This is the same kind of probability you know. This is called a utility you know. So let me zoom into this node to show you how they look like. And this is very general. It's not specific to this tool. This is just Bayesian analysis. Um, we can, I have probably theory on this because I plan to talk later. So again, this is just go home or stay away. Got contract just tells me it depends on whether you went home or stay at work. It has two probabilities. And utility depends. It's a number, it's a real number that depends on the number of parts. Utility is how is this going to go? How much money am I going to make? Or what is the final outcome? And in this case, utility depends on whether I got the contract, uh, whether there is a burglary, and whether I got home. And the reason it depends on whether I go home or not is because if I go home and there's a burglary, I stop the burglary early and I won't lose nearly as much than if I don't go home. Um, so when I go to the utility, I can kind of basically these are numbers I just made up. But you can imagine that in the best, the best scenario is that basically I stay at work and there is no burglary. Uh, and basically I close my contract for five. I basically get paid five dollars, whatever. Okay? Now, if I stay at work and close my contract, but there is a burglary, I'm going to lose 10 in my very by my half minus the five I just made. So this has a utility net effect for me of minus five. So if, if I stay at work and I get a contract, but there is a burglary, I'll get minus five. This is just data, right? This is not a prediction. This is just a fact. If this were to happen, this is what I would get. These are all the possible combinations. If I don't, if I stay at work and there is a burglary, so I get fully robbed for a total of minus 10, I cannot stop the burglary, and then I don't even close the contract, and I lose everything minus 10. And then basically, if, if I stay at work and there is no burglary, and there is no alarm, and there is no contract, well, I just get my regular salary, minus nine. Now, if I go home, then basically my utilities change, Again, I can stop the burglary, so the burglary is no longer an issue. And if I close the contract, I make the five, and if I don't make the contract, I get one, and it doesn't matter. But the probability of making the contract is lower. The interesting thing about this is that now I can start running interesting cases. Um, let's see how this looks. So when I compile this network, now, one thing is, okay, let's say that John calls. First of all, let's look at utilities. These are marginal utilities. In the absence of any of information, if you go home, you're likely to make 3,000. If you stay at work, you are likely to, to make 4.5 thousand. Based on the numbers we've entered in this distribution. We don't know if there's burglary, we don't know if there's earthquake, we don't know anything. On average, this is what is going to happen. However, if John calls, <laughs> and I execute the probability system, now basically what he's telling me is, my utilities are changed. If I go home, I'm likely to make 3,000. If I stay at work, I'm likely to make 3.25. So I probably should stay home even if John's gone. Based on this number, again, this depends on the numbers, right? If I change my numbers, everything changes. But you can see now how you can automate, automate the process. Like if Mary also calls, probably at that point, the probability of the burglary has gone sufficiently up that when I execute the guy, now, probably, basically, if I stay at work, if both of them call it, and I stay at work, I'm going to lose money. Because the burglary is like, sufficiently likely to be happening that even if I close the contract, I'm still going to be worse off. So, again, this depends on the numbers. But you can see how this can be put into a process. Right? So, you wouldn't do this for medical informatics, the kind of modeling I'm going to show later. But when you're, say, doing some kind of web analytics, you might want to basically, in real time, have such a model. Basically, some of this, every, every, whatever your data comes in, you start observing certain things, you make some predictions, and basically, based on the utility computing, you trigger some actions, and this, these actions influence other things, and you could basically have a whole process driven by these things. Um, 
depending on whether you are in a more automatic system or whether you are and you're trying to build something like this, as a kind of decision-based system to automate some form of web process, you would use something like this, or even to analyze. I mean, sometimes you would do this just to understand your domain, but you would not necessarily implement it automatically, but you would want to understand, and then you, from this, you might want to build some rule-based system. You say, okay, well, now that I understand, at the end of the day, the only thing I need to do is now these two things, I'm going to go home, right? So I, I to implement this whole thing, I might not need the whole thing. But if I use the whole thing, they would be easier to automate. I'm going to stop the hands-on now, because I think this gives you a feeling. The tool is called Unbase. I don't know if here it is. It's free to download. You just saw me use it, and you can see they have tutorials on YouTube to how to use it. But I think you get a feel for how it goes. I could continue clicking, and it would be interesting to observe, and it would be nice to understand how you change certain probabilities in the tables, how the different things change, but I don't need to do that. You can do it. So are, there, are there packages in Python or R that could do Bayesian networks? There are. And, and people who do the class wrote their own. They are easy to write. If your goal is to actually do the mathematics, these are just products and multiplications of the tables. So they are, you can find them. What is difficult about these models is to learn this shape from your data set. So, and, and again, I use the decision to do for that. That is a harder problem. You can fiddle with it. And typically, if you're feeling a structure, well, I, can, I would. <laughs> Basically, the answer is yes, there are, if you, once you have the data to, to do the number crunching, there are many packages. To learn, there are some, but they are not fully automated. It's not as simple as this is my table, please give me the name. There is no, in my opinion, there is no, on any, on any tool, I mean, as I say, even in the decision you do, you would need some form of interactive knowledge, because uh, for the kind of problems you, we just saw before in the earthquake, right? Oh, it seems to work, and then I click, and then I get in the right predictions on the right combination. So, but yes, there are there are there are tools uh, for for the actual number crunching in many languages. In any, there are many libraries. Once, so once you have this table, it's okay. I want to use this in a process. Okay, you don't use Unbase for that, or or, or faster analytics. You basically use one of these libraries. You, you encode your numbers, which can, there is a way of saving this in a standard format that any tool will read, and then and then you implement your process. You see that tool from a network that you learn somewhere else. So, so yeah, you can you can play with it and try to understand. I mean, the idea, the idea is to try to understand how information flows. When if I click on this, will things will things change there? And understanding that is is the key aspect. So what I want to do now. Um, what I want to do now is change to the other type of monitor. Professor, um, yes. are you, you going to skip? Can you explain naive aids really quickly? I'm not going to speak. We're going to do that. We're not going to. We're going to do that. Uh, naive base is the version of the alarm that didn't work. So basically, well, I, I want to get there. I'm just trying to fast forward. Okay, we're almost there. Almost there. We're almost there. Some some experiments. Okay, so as I say, I normally use the decision Q2, but some base is free. Um, decision systems. Well, decision systems is what we I just talked. I don't need to go through the theory because. I think you got a feel for how they work. So, um, so a few more considerations. Um, how are we doing time? Okay, we have 15 minutes. Okay, so variable selection. This is an interesting topic, and I don't see what I see now. So basically, I've been showing naive examples when earthquake happens or it doesn't happen. And our reason it doesn't happen. That's not how the real world works. That's not, none of the variables in a real system looks like that. Um, typically, we use categorical variables because you, uh, you can use continuous variables, but the distributions that can be handled by most tools are only Gaussian. And that's a limitation that is very strong because when you get into these conditional effects, they are Gaussians are too linear and they don't provide the right thing. So typically, what you end up doing is just binning your variables. Um, and typically, because you don't have that much data anyway, you see the continuous variable is not basically you have to use some kind of distribution and use Gaussians. Anyway, binning is just a matter of assigning 
variables to, to concrete categories. And when you have a continuous range, if you have a multi-model distribution, well, you just find the groups of your distribution and you try to do it. Or you could use some form of equal area binning, where basically you pick threshold such that the area inside of each of the bins is of the same is the same size. So I think this is something that's pretty standard, and you probably all know about this. So data activation, well, these are things to consider, and these are things that I think are useful in any kind of modeling. Um, one thing that is interesting is that when data is scarce, quality is more important than quantity. This is not true. Typically, when you have big data, within reason, you can expect that your techniques are robust and they will find the signal from the noise. So if you keep adding data, even if the data has a lot of noise and it has missing variables, you think, well, okay, I have a lot of it. The system will figure out what is statistically significant. In Bayesian analytics, it is hard, right? The system is trying to determine these conditional independence assumptions. There is all these possibilities, right? Like, we didn't talk about, I mean, we'll talk about this in a few minutes, actually. But I mean, there's all these possible orderings of my variables, depending on how I order them and choose which one I could probably leave out. Things get very complicated. So the reality is, if your data is not clean, it is worth to clean in the in Bayesian analysis. That's only in general true, garbage in, garbage out. But frankly, when in big data, there's been a little kind of like, oh, you know what, don't worry about it, just throw it in the system with them. Definitely not true when you don't have a lot of data. So. Things to consider, every bin should have enough record. Sometimes you end up finding that you do some final form of binning and you get very high quality predictions, it seems like. But then you start looking at this, this is this variable only occurs three cases. In those three cases, yes, I've observed that, so the variable seems to be incredibly predictive. But it's only three cases, so you just need to make sure. This goes back to when you're building your joint distributions. You need to make sure that every bin, and by every bin, I mean every combination of whatever you have on the right of every one of your factors, has enough data to fill in. So if you have a, a probability of x given y, x, y, z, x, sorry, y, I can call it whatever, y, b, c, d, you need to make sure that for every combination of a, b, c, d, you have enough records for every value of x. And if you don't, you cannot. You need to think harder. You need to break this down into other forms of distribution or more products because you just don't have enough data to estimate this particular factor, let alone the rest of the product. So every bin, basically, every bin should have a record. If a variable is very unevenly split, basically, you may not have enough records for the same reason. Basically, for some of its values, they may be rare, so you may want to either the variable itself is irrelevant to the process of prediction, or you may want to rebin differently. So in Bayesian analytics, a common process is you start with the easier variables that are understood in your system. You build a model and you use that as baseline. Okay, you know what? If I only use these four variables for prediction, I can try a lot of combinations of conditional independence. I it is I build a baseline, and then from there, can I do better? You can start adding more variables and do the, uh, play with that. Again, it, there is a it's a manually intensive process because there is not a lot of data, so. And there are, there are definitely tools that make this. When I say manually intensive, I'm talking there are hundreds of variables and it may take you a few months. But given that there are hundreds of variables and that you don't understand, it's not unreasonable. I don't mean five variables. This is not an issue. Feature engineering is something that used to be very popular. It's less popular now in most domains, but it still is popular in Bayesian analytics. Feature engineering, the idea is the idea of creating synthetic variables by you combining manually parallel actual variables. In modern times, if you're using convolutional neural networks or similar techniques, if you have enough data, people say, you know what, the network will learn how to combine the values to produce high predictions. That is true if you have enough data. But if you don't have enough data, it still may be reasonable to do, to combine some of your bins and to understand your process of how to basically organize the system so that you can feed it to one of these learning tools. Again, the challenge you're facing is that you don't have a lot of data, so you have to use your data cleverly. One nice thing about the uh, Bayesian analytics is that missing data is handled very simply. Like basically, if you have tables with lots of holes, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, you're just filling basically counts. And if you don't know if a record doesn't, basically if a record has a hole, that means you have to drop the whole record. So that there, I have a, a table. Right? Variables A through Z. Okay, and, and then each of them takes values. Okay, and then there are holes all the time, everywhere. There are missing data everywhere. The reality is to fill in, say, this table, 
I only need the five columns where these variables apply. So I can take any record where these five values are present and use it for my count. And the fact that my whole table has a lot of holes doesn't matter because as long as I have enough records where these five variables are present for every combination, I'm safe. And the same will be true, so even if my table has a lot of missing data, I can fill in last, basically I can fill in all my factors, as long as the data doesn't... Um, now, that is the data is missing at random, meaning the data is missing for reasons that are not relevant to my prediction. But often, the data is not missing at random. There is a correlation between me not having data and the value of the variable I'm trying to predict. When that happens, the way you handle it, okay, if you believe that that is true, instead of Basically, leaving the, the record empty, you put an extra value that is called missing. And you use missing as one of the possible values, and then you then, then, then the data doesn't have missing values there, and then you throw it to the system, and the system can handle it. So either way, you can try, and uh, you know the answer, or you test. So, uh, right. So, um, Modeling you say, uh, modeling you say, well, this is what we've been talking until a second ago. So basically, there are two parts to learning one is, uh, so to learning this model. One of them is learning the structure, where which are my variables, what are the values that they take, what are the edges that connect it, which variable to which. This is hard because basically I have to define the variable condition independence of function. Yes, you definitely need to use tools for this, but and even with the tools, there is an interactive process of validating. Okay, the, the tool will give you candidate network, but then you'll have to do sophisticated cross-validation approaches to decide, okay, the tool give me this network, but they're not the same. And in fact, for the basic cases, they will be the same because if the tool cannot predict the basic cases, I mean, the model cannot predict the basic cases, we perform badly always. But then you will have to go into more sophisticated cases and scientifically, the space where the real money is in your business is a very narrow space of the total set of variables. Right? So you may have a million records, but the reality is you already knew how to handle 950,000 of them. Is this other 50,000 that were interesting where you had there is something to be made? The other, 50, the other 950,000 you already understood perfectly on your business using a number of techniques. So this may mean that you may have to focus on your validation in those cases and things like that. So the point being that once you learn learning the structure of the network, it's hard and it's tricky and you have to do things. But once you do that, the way you fill in the numbers is never by hand like we've done here. Nobody does it. Any tool will fill the numbers from a table. Like, I mean, because it's just a matter of counting. So you use your data. Once you have hypothesized a particular data structure, a particular network structure, you fill in the potential by your data set. And this is easy. And no, I mean, here I've been guessing, oh, we could put 0.1% probability of earthquake. That's just like, okay, we go and count how many times these things happen, and okay, we just put them, right? So, so you would not try to get this, and people are particularly bad at estimating probabilities or in medical or in any other domain. So, again, the structure, you may hypothesize, you may play with your own ideas, the numbers you always fill in from data. Um, in particular, you don't just fill in the exact counts. You end up with you introduce what is called a non-informative prior, which sometimes means you're trying to smooth. It's a, it's a way of smoothing out your count. Sometimes some of the beans might be a lot less represented than other beans, and that might skew your distribution. Even if I already told you you should have enough data to make sure that the bean has enough data, sometimes the, the size of the bean can skew the result. So you would add some non-informative prior, and that simply means that you might initialize all the records with a small count. So hey, you know what? Even if for every B, for every number that I have in this table, I'm going to say it's at least 0 0.01 for every factor, or something like that. They don't take this a little more complicated, but the tools can do this. But the point is understanding that typically you don't get when you start. If you were to look at it, why why is this number not exactly the value divided by x plus y like I thought it should be? It's like well, the tool is changing that slightly to make it more robust to the noise in your table. So that when it makes predictions, it will be closer to the future, or basically to what you expect it to be in the future. So, structure learning. So, what is, well, okay, so this is so hard, so what are my choices? What can I do? Okay, so option number one, you use naive Bayes. We'll see that in the next slide. Option number two, uh, you start talking to, to, to people who are experts in your domain and try to between your understanding of what the arrows mean and what they are telling you, you try to start building these things. It's kind of the exercise we went with the alarm. When I said, okay, well, the things are independent of which, you find the domain models and you start. 
You don't need to learn every single one of them. Anything that you learn from the expert is something that your tool doesn't have to deal with. So you can allow the type of the tool to do to find a more interesting one. The reality is experts are the more eliciting models from experts is actually difficult. I mean, it's not like it's possible, it's difficult because that's not how they think about their own domain. So trying to get the models out of them requires an expertise and a practice that you need to understand what they're saying and convert it to the model because you cannot just hope the you cannot ask them to draw you the network. Because and that would have mean what they, what they think they need. So but it can help. Uh, you definitely can learn models from data. Again, it's a hybrid process. And what makes it difficult is that the tool basically it has to use some kind of search process of the space of possible structures. Now, you can use some form of greedy approach. You can use, there are a lot of techniques, and my, my PhD thesis was on this topic. So there are things you can do, but it is a fundamentally hard problem in a mathematical sense of hard, which means there is a lot of possible things to try. And if you don't have a lot of data, it's not like there's no time to try them. The system, some of the tools nowadays can try a lot of them, but if you don't have a lot of data, it's hard without you giving it, if you basically say, I don't know anything, you learn from the data. Typically, your data doesn't have enough information to learn a good model, because the reality is you do know something. And there are models where, when you say that this is stupid, you say, well, if you knew it was stupid, you should have told me the price of model. The tool will tell you. So the point being that these tools typically require you to give them some Intuition, I mean, it seems like the, like the spaceship. You have to tell the, the tool as well. How did I know spaceships for Alpha and Dory are rare? You never told me that. It wasn't in the data. But all of you thought so. So, anyway, the, 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 these tools have ways of introducing that kind of information into them. But it requires some work on them. So, so, so that base basically is, is a very simple assumption. Okay, let's have this super strong assumption. Let's say all informative variables are. Conditionally independent of each other given the target variable. Okay, well, this is the right base assumption. You make this assumption, that gives you this structure. You're done. You take your target variable and you have arrows leading your target variable to all the other variables. Um, when you do that, basically you get this kind of model. The problem is that if your assumption is bad, your structure will be bad. And this is a particular result. I mean, this is a particular example of what happens. This model, which is the naive model based model, has a this model, which is a naive model, model has a performance of 0.52. I'll explain what this number means in a second. This other one is 0.60, 70, 70, 70. Um, So it makes a difference. So picking the wrong one doesn't work so well. So what this what this area under the curve mean basically is uh, what does this number mean? Well, one nice thing about probabilistic models is that they don't give me a prediction. They give me a prediction and a probability of that prediction. That allows me to sort my predictions by how confident I am. And sorting my predictions by how confident I am allows me to rank all of my predictions in a way in which I can, depending on the confidence of my prediction, come up with a threshold to say, okay, I will, if the probability is greater than 0.6 of the, of the, of the, of the burglary, I will go home. If it's greater than 0.7, I'll go home. It's your choice. And which number you go home is your choice. And that number basically means you have an infinite number of choices. And each of those choices gives you a different decision approach. And each of these decisions has a different sensitivity and specificity. And basically what the Bayesian allow model allows you to do is to produce such a curve. Depending on which threshold you do, you will be operating at a different point on the curve. And a better model would be a curve that goes closer to that. Basically, if you pick the right threshold, you're always right. And a worse model is that you know, matter, no matter which threshold you pick, you always end up erring in either side. So the area under the curve, which is basically the area under the curve of this decision, is a measure of how good the model is regardless of which threshold you decide to take. Uh, an ideal area would be one, the full square, a random model, which is no matter on flipping a coin, would be 50-50, which is, would be the line C, which would be a point five area under the curve. I have a question. Yes? Does ROC work with your dependent variable binary? What if your dependent variable is multinomial? Well, so if your dependent variable is multinomial, it depends. Uh, basically, this is sensitivity versus specificity. So whether you're trying to decide whether your dependent variable was predicted correctly or not. So you have a dependent variable, but then you have is, was that variable right or wrong? And that is binary, right? So my dependent variable may be the age range. Between 10, my, my, my user is between 0 and 15, between 15 and 20, between 20 and 30, between 30 and 50. Uh, okay, that's multinomial. So then, 
Did I get this right or did I get this not right? And that one is binary. So you can convert your multinomial to binary and to get this approach. Computing matrix theory. Yeah, yeah, you could use you could use a number of techniques. I, I, I'm just showing that one because I, it was a previous result. Yeah, I mean, you could use any way of, once you have made a prediction, any way of validating your prediction applies. I mean, so. One, again, the nice thing, what I'm saying is, because you get a probability associated with your prediction, you can use an ROC. But you can use any other technique that doesn't require that probability. So once you made a prediction, you can start saying, how often did I get it right? How do you, and yes, which, it should have been A, but I got B, or it should have been C, but I got A, so you get your prediction. Inference is basically a little problem. What I'm saying here is simply that even after you have decomposed your probability into products, and each product is tractable, and you have statistically in a way that is statistically significant, freeing your numbers, you still have the problem of how do I make predictions when I have to multiply a hundred of these, each of which I say eight numbers, at the end I have the whole thing ballooming. Right? If I have to sum all these numbers, even if I produce them by multiplying things, so if the numbers are statistically significant, I still have some freedom for them. So in reality, you do not multiply things in a brute force approach. There are more advanced mathematical algorithms. I don't need to go into them. The tools implement this. They can feel that the tools do implement. So you give the potential, then you ask the question, and you get an answer, which didn't come from multiplying everything and summing up everything. You can be smarter than that. Um, I don't need to explain what those things are. Um, so, yes, please. Uh, so, so Markov chains versus Higgins. I mean, they seem to be sort of connected. Yes, well, so a Markov chain can be understood. So the Markov assumption is basically that a variable is independent of all its ancestors, given its prior ancestors. So you can imagine that the Markov chain is a particular type of Bayesian network where your variables are basically a chain. Right, exactly, they are in a chain. So B given A, basically, when you have this chain, you get the Markov assumption because this variable is independent of everything behind given this one. But the information will flow if you didn't know this one. So, so basically, this is a generalization, right? Because Markov chain is just in a Bayesian network where you just have all your nodes in a narrow in a set and, and just link these arrows in the same direction. So you had a problem that was that you knew was sequential. Right. Uh, is there a Okay, so that's a very good question, and I don't know how much, uh, okay, I know how much time this is zero, but um, I'm introducing what is called a uh, Bayesian network, which is the basic thing, but then you get you can get to what is called object-oriented Bayesian networks. So the idea is, well, what if my process is sequential? What if today I have this alarm, tomorrow I have this alarm, it's the same network, the day after that I have this alarm, it's the same network, the day, the day after that I have this alarm, it's the same network, the day after that it's the same network, but there's information flowing from one day to the next. So not only within the day, so here we've been seeing information flowing within the alarm ringing. Yeah, so you are doing that and you can, you don't have to, I mean, you could learn it as a, hey, you know what, the model today is the same as the model of yesterday. So even though the evidence today is different, today I heard the alarm, yesterday I didn't, but, but, but you can have it. So I'm not, I didn't cover any of that theory, but yes, there are extensions to the regular framework which allow you like to do things like that. Um, and again, the tools can do them, the principles, at the high level are the same, the details are a little trickier, but yes, there are things that get to do that. Um, and things eventually get complicated because some variables are over different periods of time, and you can, so basically some variables are, for today, I have a chain, I mean, for every day, but then for every month, I have these other variables that are the same once per month, so you get more complicated patterns. And there are ways of modeling those, and typically, you don't explicitly show the representation, so basically you, you can have recurrent networks, so where the network influences itself with the full understanding that it doesn't mean at the time step, there is a time delay. Just, I run this evidence, when I have this number, then on the next iteration, this output of this one is an input of the next one. It would be like a recurrent network if you were doing convolutional networks or something like that, if you're familiar with that paradigm. So you can do more than that, this is the basics. This is truly the basic. I mean, what I'm showing you is, this is an introduction to Bayesian, uh, to Bayesian model. This is not, I do not expect you to be fully, I mean, there is a lot more to this than this, but yes, this is it. Um, I have a couple uh, use cases. I don't want to spend time on this, it's super late. Um, these are, as I said, as I mentioned, Decision Q is a company that does that, that Bayesian analytics, and they've given me basically two use cases of things that they've recently done, these projects. So uh, this is a project done for Walter Reed in, in the Army is trying to help surgeons 
this is the network without, with, with, this is the main part of their network without details and without the decision nodes because they didn't want to show that. But basically, it's a network where they're trying to predict when you have a very large industrial accident or a, or a war accident and you have a very serious injury. There is an issue where you want to close the, the, the wound early. When do you want to close the wound? Because if you close it early, it may get infected and you have to leave it open. I mean, and you have to open it later in case of other problems and it has costs associated with it. But if you leave it open, you have to do the bread man. You have to clean it every day and, um, and keep it like sanitized and also it's expensive. So trying to understand what is the optimal time to do this procedure is the goal of this method. And basically you measure certain virus, some of which are the results of tests, so you're applying some tests on the patient. Some of them have to do with the all the things that you basically, uh, things that with the treatment you are giving to the patient and with other information you do that and then basically they make a prediction and the end result of that prediction is um, that's the other one, okay. So basically, as I said, this was this was done uh, by Walter Reed and Cishan Q, and you have the data set, the, the, the slides you can read, and I, I didn't write these slides, the Cishan Q gave them to me. But basically the point being that through the right decision diagrams, you end up being able to, to save money. And one of the things that they want to showcase is that they didn't have, they, the data came from a lot of different places, so they built this model by taking very heterogeneous data set, and they were explaining how the technique was very suitable because they were able to use parts of the model from different data sets and then assemble them together into a single model. And that the model, if fully deployed, which now is under trial, but if fully deployed, would save a lot of money by basically being able to save money by doing the, the right thing at the right time so you don't have to do the wrong thing and then and do, and do it again. Another application that this has been, that they use, is basically FastFX. And this is actually under clinical trials now. And basically, it has to do with when you have metastatic bone disease. So this is a type of cancer in the bone. Um, in addition to treating the cancer, the bones become so fragile that you have to supplement them. And there is three possible options uh, to supplementing them. Um, basically, you could do nothing. You could put um, you could put an intramedullary nail or you could do a whole endoprosthesis, which replaces most of the inside of the bone for structure. They have different costs, they have different prices, and the idea basically, I, I mean, I don't, I, we don't need to go through the details of this particular example. I just want to go to their network. The point, there are a couple of things that I wanted to show. One of them is, which is very interesting, I thought it was interesting to share. What the doctor, oh, you don't see it, I'm going to go back to the TV. Yeah. <laughs> this is interesting just to realize. What the doctor thinks is not the thing, the same thing that he tells you, and it's not what really happens. So it's worth to recognize that he now, he doesn't tell you, he, he is optimistic in what he tells you, but he's actually optimistic in how in what he actually thinks. <laughs> so, so there is a lot of optimism. So the result of this is because he's trying to be helpful and, and being positive will help. So it's not that it's not being helpful to tell you, but anyway. So the point being that. That, uh, so, we could just draw the numbers, but it's not that. So the point being is simply that at the end of the day, they are using patient network models to build these models that are now being used in clinical settings. So, so these things are easy to get one. Anyway, you do have the full slide of the presentation. If you want to know more, you can contact them at the session queue. And thank you very much for being here and staying so late.